interesting spot for that <laughs> Dreamed I was missing and you were so scared. i
Okay, let's get this party going. Um, bef- Sorry, did you say something, Sam? Okay. Let's okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, welcome to the Twilight Eclipse virtual table read with me and my friends. Um, I'm very excited to get going, but first, um, I'd like to acknowledge that um, I am broadcasting from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, and um, that include the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Um, tw- the Twilight Saga series franchise um, actually incorporates the Quileute people and- in their storytelling, and um, they are an actual sovereign nation in La Pushed, Washington. Um, And the Twilight series has kind of misrepresented and appropriated uh, the people and and they've not received any sort of remuneration um, despite like the the success and um, uh, like financial gain that the Twilight Sega has accrued. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that there's more um, resources and a uh, donation link in the description box of this video. So if you'd like, you can go and check that out. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, readers of this read. I'm just going to call out your real name and you can introduce yourself and then uh, tell us who you'll be reading for. So first up on my screen is Brad. Hey guys, uh, I'll be playing the parts of Mike, Emmett, Cullen, and Jared. Michaela. Hello, I will again be Bella Swan. Eric. Hi, I'm Eric. Uh, I'll be reading Riley and Seth. (laughs) Uh, Bennett. Hello. I'm Bennett Taylor, and I'll be playing the roles of Billy, Felix, Embry, and Bree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron? Hello, friends. Uh, my name is Aaron, and I will be playing the roles of Renee, Esme, Maria, and Leah. Charlie? I mean, oh my gosh, I just see you as Charlie. Um, Aiden? I've been, uh, yes, I'm Aiden Wright, prominent method actor, and I will be playing the role <laughs> of Charlie Swan. Thank you. Uh, Stephen? Hi, I'm Stephen Richardson. Uh, I'm playing the roles of Jasper and Eric. Noah? Hello, I'm Noah. I'll be playing the roles of Dr. Carlisle Cullen and Quill. Uh, Darren? Hi, I'm reading for Alec, Royce, and Tristan. Awesome. Camille. Hello, I'm reading for Edward Cullen. <laughs> uh, Kate. Hi, my name is Kate Bichelier, and I am reading for the part of Jacob Black. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, she's going to leave it there. Uh, Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah Kashukja, and I'll be reading for Rosalie and for Angela. Uh, Megan? Hello, I'm Megan, and I'll be reading for Emily, Jane, and Nettie. Taryn? Hello, I'm Taryn. I am our resident baddie, Victoria, as well as reporter, Paul, and Lucy. All baddie characters. Uh, Nikki? Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm reading for Alice and Jessica. And Pete, who is joining us for the very first time, round of applause. Professional uh, actor, uh, Pete uh, Randall. I'm holding down the English for you all guys. Uh, I'm playing Sam, John, and Dimitri. Awesome. Okay. So that is everyone that is going to be reading today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are going to get started. Okay. Written by Melissa Rosenberg. This is Twilight Eclipse. Fade in, exterior Seattle, aerial shot approaching the city, night. Exterior, Pike Place Market, Seattle, night, one year ago. Rain comes down in sheets, slapping the cobblestones. Bright lights come from the surrounding bars, reflect off the wet stones. The dull thud of rock music wafts out. A bar door opens. The music briefly blasts out as a young man exits. 
He is Riley, 22, genial, handsome, a university student full of promise. He pauses under the awning, preparing to face the rain. He slings a messenger bag over his shoulder, laden with thick school texts. He waves to his friends in the window before heading into the downpour. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Another street, dark, deserted. Riley makes his way up. Suddenly, a shadow flies past him, moving at an inhuman speed. Riley pauses. What was that? Unnerved, he speeds his step, about to round a corner, but suddenly something leaps over him, knocking him backward to the ground. It moved so fast, we, again, saw only a brief shadow. Riley panics now. Who's there? No response. Riley bolts in a different direction. Yet another street. Riley runs, beelining toward the end of the street at which stands an apartment building with a brightly lit lobby and a security guard. Safety. But something grabs him by the neck and slings him into a building window. It cracks. Riley drops. The shadow won't let him reach the security guard. Riley's terrified and new by this creature's strength. He drops his book bag and staggers off, running for his life down a different street. He looks over his shoulder, stumbling, desperate. Exterior waterfront, night. Riley finds himself on the deserted boardwalk. Beyond the rail, black water, a dead end. He turns, realizing he's utterly alone. He's been herded here. He searches the darkness for whatever is chasing him. What do you want? Why are you here? The shadow darts past him. Riley yanks his hand back. Oh, God! He grips his hand in pain, looks at it to find a crescent moon shape on his palm, blood seeping out. He's been bit! His confusion and terror turn to agony as the venom from the bite crawls up his arm. Riley drops to his knees, crying out in pain. Ah! Writhing as the venom spreads throughout his body, changing him, killing his humanity. His tortured cries go unheard as we push in on the crescent moon on his hand, over which we hear. From what I've tasted of desire... I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice... Match cut Bella's forearm on her crescent moon scar, whiter than her already pale skin. Edward's lips move into frame, kissing the scar. Exterior meadow day, Bella and Edward, lying in the grass. Bella reads aloud from a book of Robert Frost poetry. I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Edward Lee... Edward teasingly pulls her book away, moves to kiss her. She stops him. English final, gotta focus. He grins, kisses her anyway. The sun briefly comes out from behind clouds, causing Edward's skin to sparkle, making the kiss appear magical. He pulls away, smiling. Marry me. She laughs. It's not the first nor 50th time he's asked. This is clearly a game between them. No. He kisses her face. Marry me. Change me. Kisses her neck. Where I come, it's the way one says I love you. She affectionately pushes him away, jumping up. Where I come from, it's the way one says I got knocked up. She starts to gather up her coat and books. He's suddenly right in front of her. We didn't see him move. He playfully grabs her stuff from her. You're worried about what people will think. I'm worried that two out of three marriages end in divorce. The divorce rate amongst immortals is much lower. They're inches apart, the game laced with their attraction. Marry me. Not yet. It's almost four. I'm supposed to come home straight from school. He pulls her close, kisses her. It'll be on time. I won't give your father another reason to hate me. As he easily slings her around onto his back, we cut to interior Bella's house day, start on Chief Charlie Swan, still in uniform from a day at the station. His brow is furrowed with concern as he reads the Seattle Times. Headlines, murders, disappearances, possible work of serial killer. The article worries him. He checks his watch just as the front door opens. Bella enters, throws down her book bag. Charlie is looking at his watch. Four o'clock on the dot. This, does he have some stopwatch or something? His name is Edward. And now he's too punctual for you? As she starts toward the stairs. Oh, oh, wait wait a sec, will you? Sit down. She pauses, then moves to a chair. Sits. He faces her. You understand why you're being punished, right? Three days. No word. You come back on Edward's arm like nothing happened. Yes, I'm sorry. But Edward's in my life. That won't change. I'm getting that. So I'll make a deal with you. No more being grounded if... You use your new freedom to see your other friends too. I'm like Jacob. Bella darkens, a painful subject. Charlie notes this. What? 
Edward can't handle little competition? There is no competition. Well, I'm sure Jake would rather be just friends and nothing at all. Then he should return my phone calls. His dad's worried about him, Bells. Jake's having a really hard time. Bella stops. This hurts her to hear. I remember when that was you. You needed a friend and Jake was there. It might be worth another try. Interior Bella's bedroom day. Bella opens her desk drawer and pulls out a folded note. It's worn, having been read many times. She unfolds it. Insert the handwritten note. Several sentences have been crossed out. Only one line at the bottom is legible. It reads, I miss you too. Doesn't change anything. Off Bella, deeply troubled, but deciding something. She takes out her fashionable, desirable Hypnokia phone and holds down a button, speed dial. The word Jake, the word Jake comes up on the screen and possibly a shot of him happy in former days, but maybe before he cut his hair. Straight to voicemail. Exterior Bella's house, night. Bella exits the house, heads to her truck, climbs in. Bella turns the key, nothing. She tries again, it's dead. With a slight gust of wind, suddenly Edward is sitting next to her. She jumps, catching her breath. You frightened me, deciding to go down to the reservation. How'd you... Alice had a vision. His guilty face is her answer. He tries to make light of it. I'm afraid my studies have never extended to fixing cars, just disabling them. I'll send Emmett around in the morning. Jacob could fix that. He's good with his hands. Edward seems unprovoked by this. The wolves aren't in control of themselves. You've never hurt me. Not intentionally. After graduation, I'll be one of you and that'll be it. He'll hate me for good. Bella, you have to understand. Your safety is everything to me. Edward, I will be safe. Deeply conflicted, he looks down with regret, resignation. I'm sorry. She looks at him, then gets angry, forces open her door. Exterior Bella's house, night. Bella climbs out, slams the truck door. Edward appears next to her. I want you to be happy, but alive is more important. Frustrated, she pushes past him and heads to the house. He appears on the stairs before she reaches them. I'll understand if you're too angry for me to come to your room tonight. Just close the window. Bella's bedroom, night. On the open window, Bella closes and locks it. Beat. Another beat. Then she unlocks the window, opens it a bit, looks at it, opens it as wide as it will go. Interior Forks High School Cafeteria Day. Bella and Edward sit with Angela, Eric, Mike, and Jessica. Edward and Bella are on the end, slightly apart. Angela is busy addressing a pile of note card envelopes. Mike writes what he's saying on a legal pad. Oh, Bradley, you are muted. Every time. My (laughs) fellow students, we are the future. Anything is possible if we just believe. Blah, blah, blah. He rips the page off, hands it to Jessica. Yeah, this will be my speech. If I want people to throw their diploma at my head. She crumples the paper, tosses it at him. You gotta embrace the cliches, Jess. They are the bread and butter of all valedictorians. Mm, And this is why you're not valedictorian. Uh, Mm. I chose to exit the political arena to spend more time with my family. Jess doesn't need cliches. She's going to rock that speech. Rock? It'll change lives. Alice and Jasper have abruptly appeared carrying trays of food they won't eat. As they say, I've decided to throw a party. After all, how many times will we graduate high school? Edward stifles a smile. A party? At your house. Whoa. I've never seen your house. No one's ever seen their house. Another party, Alice? It'll be fun. That's what you said last time. Suddenly Alice freezes, her eyes glazing over. She's having a vision. Mike hasn't noticed yet. Well, cool. That's really uh, normal of you. Well, what time? Dress code? Bring anything? Cheetos? A beat as Alice still looks into the distance. Awkward. Bella looks at Edward, concerned. Edward shrugs it off. Nothing to worry about. Wake up, Alice. She hasn't been getting much sleep lately, senior jitters. This sounds weird and weirdly fluent coming from Jasper, but it serves to break the moment. Interior Sheriff's Station evening. Bella and Edward enter. Charlie is behind the counter talking with a middle-aged couple, Doug and Nancy Byers, whose faces are etched with grief and worry. So what was that at school? What did Alice see? Nothing. Something about Jasper. It was innocuous. 
didn't seem that way. I was just worried that everyone would notice how strange Alice is. <laughs> I think that ship sailed a long time ago. Charlie looks up at Bella and Edward and subtly gestures for them to keep their distance. It could be interpreted as hostile. He'll get over it someday. Don't worry. No, that's not what, what's bothering him. Those people. Their son has gone missing. Bella can read their feelings on Edward's face. Do you know something about this? Seattle. Unexplained disappearances, killings. We've been tracking it for a while. Really? You think... Our kind generally stick to victims who won't be missed, or they move on quickly, but whoever's in Seattle isn't playing by the rules. You said if vampires kill too, too conspicuously, the Volturi step in. But if they go to Seattle, they could come up here, see I'm still human. He turns to her strong, reassuring. We won't let it get that far. We'll protect you, whatever it takes. Hey, uh, you ready, Bells? As Charlie approaches, off Bella watching the anguished buyers exit. I'll call if I hear anything at all. Charlie puts a picture into his case. It's Riley from the opening. Exterior Sheriff's Station evening. Bella exits, flanked by Charlie and Edward. There's palpable tension between the two men. It is just us two for dinner, right? Dad? I'm just dropping Bella off, sir. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, Bella, my parents wanted me to remind you about that airline ticket they gave you for your last birthday. Bella eyes him with suspicion, but he appears guileless. What airline ticket? A uh, round trip to Florida to visit mom. That was generous. It expires soon. They thought you might want to use it this weekend. I can't just drop everything and go. It could be your last chance to visit her with her before you graduate. This lands with Bella. You know, it wouldn't hurt for you to get away for a couple days. Get some time away. I, I would like to see mom. Maybe I will go. If you'll use the companion ticket. Wait, there are two tickets? Close on Bella's face, illuminated by bright sunlight. Exterior of Renee's beach bungalow Florida day. Bella's face is turned upward to soak in the warm sun. Aren't you going to miss this? Include her mother, Renee. They lie in chaise, they lie in chaise lounges, pushed tightly together on the deck of this funky bungalow. The warmth on your skin, the vitamin D soaking into your pores. I will. Colleges in Florida are a lot sunnier. What? I'll never see you if you go to the University of Alaska. Which is the point. Guilt washes over Bella. She takes Renee's hand, absently plays with the bracelet on her wrist, trying to soak up her mother as much as the sun. They have a good science program. A science program, you need Edward program. Renee nudges Bella, who smiles, looks inside the house. Bella's POV, interior beach bungalow, through the window. Edward sits in an easy chair with a clear view of Bella. He offers a small wave, then turns back to his conversation with Phil, who lies on his back on the couch. Renee squeezes her hand a beat, then glances back at Edward. The way he watches you, it's like he's ready to leap in front of you and take a bullet or something. And that's a bad thing? It's an intense thing. And you're different with him. If he moves, you move like magnets. We're just, you know, in love, I get it. I just want to make sure you're making the right choices for you. Because you're the one who has to live with them. Bella takes this in, her choice much bigger than mere geographical location. Renee sees her face cloud. All right, enough with the heavy. She reaches under chaise and pulls up a large box. Happy graduation. She sets the box in Bella's lap. Bella's dismayed. Um, I asked you not to waste your money. I didn't, I didn't, I swear. Bella opens the box to find a quilt. As she unfolds it, realizes what it is. Emotion wells up. Our trip t-shirts. Thought they'd make a nice quilt to keep you warm up there. Reveal that each square of the quilt is cut from t-shirts bought at various roadside attractions from around the Americas. Renee points. Remember that one? From Ensenada? Saw Snake Farm in Taqueria. <laughs> Who knows what was in those tacos? The, three -head the three-headed lobster in Maine. They can give you nightmares. But you were all, whoa, cool, already. The science geek at 10. 
<laughs> they laughed together, remembering their past. This is amazing, Mom. We'll add to it when you have kids. We'll take them to the world's tallest ketchup bottle and the chewing gum art museum. Renee wraps the quilt around Bella as, I didn't want you going to Alaska without me or some part of me. Bella suddenly hugs her as if for the last time and perhaps it will be. I'm gonna miss you so much. Renee's a little surprised by Bella's emotionalism, but hugs her back. Off the two of them. Exterior forest night. On Alice, her eyes glazed over, intently watching something in her mind. The woods are all mist and shadows, a stark contrast to previous bright scene. Include Emmett, then Jasper, then the other Collins, Carlisle, Esme, and Rosalie. They're spread out, stale statues, waiting for Alice, ready to spring. You're sure this is where you saw her? She's almost here. Another part of the forest, close on a pair of female feet in boots running in the rain, wet mud. But they falter, slowing to a stop, pan up to include none other than Victoria. She inhales, something smells wrong. She abruptly bolts in another direction. Back on Alice, she spins to Emmett. On your left! Emmett explodes to his left, Rosalie right behind him, Jasper and Carla go wide, looking to cut Victoria off, but Esme and Alice following up the rear, intercut with Victoria racing through the trees, tense but not afraid. Escaping is what she's good at. She reaches a ravine, she doesn't break stride, just leaps across it. Carla pulls up short, yells to Emmett and Rosalie. Wait, she's in their territory. She'll get away. No, she won't. On the other side of the ravine, three giant wolves leap onto the scene and take up the chase after Victoria. The leader is black, enormous, the Sam Wolf. A parallel chase ensues, the, the wolves and the Cullens keeping to their sides of the ravine, which we realize is the line that demarcates, demo, demarcates, demarcates, demarcates the territories. Victoria leaps back over. All ours now. The Cullens close in. Emmett grabs hold of her shoulder and hair. They roll head over Keister. Victoria uses the momentum to her advantage and flings Emmett off and over into her into a tree. She takes a split second he's down to leap back over the wolfland and keeps running. Emmett is pissed. As Emmett, I... don't! But Emmett, seeing red, flies over the ravine. The second his feet hit the other side, Paul Wolf turns to face him. There's a moment of standoff. It would be simple enough for Emmett to defuse the situation by jumping back, but that's not a style. Paul, growl, Paul growls with bravado. That just makes Emmett smile. Angle on Victoria at a safe distance now. She slows, looks back, surprised to see what's happening. She studies the conflict with curiosity, her mind working. Paul and Emmett charge each other. Bam, they roll a dozen yards in the dirt. Exterior Forks High School parking lot morning. Edward pulls his Volvo into a parking spot. Bella's in the passenger seat, sadness in her face. Edward strokes her cheek, comforting her. Are you sorry you went? No, it was great seeing mom. Just heard saying goodbye. It doesn't have to be goodbye. Is that why you wanted me to go, hoping I'd change my mind? He offers a gentle smile. I'm always hoping for that. Then abruptly he looks up, stiffens, hearing something. What? Would you stay in the car if I asked you to? She looks at him, concerned, then pulls open her door. Of course not. Exterior school parking lot. Bella and Edward emerge from the Volvo to see Jacob climb off his motorcycle and stride toward them. He wears a tight black t-shirt, grease stained jeans, no jacket in the cold. His hard expression causes other students to give him a wide berth. He looks almost dangerous, but Bella is delighted. Jake! Edward subtly, sub subtly, protectively pulls Bella back. Students watch from a distance, out of earshot. Charlie said you left town. To see my mother? Why? He's here to make sure you're still human. You want to read my mind? Enjoy. Jacob concentrates on something, and suddenly Edward seems to be distressed. What are you doing? Just taking a walk down memory lane. He's reminding me of what it was like for you when I went away. Jacob, please. Jacob takes a breath to calm himself, then faces Edward. I'm here to warn you. If you're kind, come on our land again. Wait, what? You didn't tell her? Leave it alone, Jacob. On Alice and Jasper, who gracefully and swiftly climb from their car, place themselves in proximity, just in case. 
on Mike, Eric, Jessica, and Angela, who watch the goings on. Angela clearly fears a fight. The others seem more intrigued by one. On Edward, Jacob, and Bella. Tell me. I want to know. There was a stupid misunderstanding between Emma and Paul. Nothing to worry about. Man, listen to you. Slick. Did you lie to get her out of town, too? Leave. Now. He has a right to know. She's the one the redhead wants. Victoria is back. Alice's vision wasn't about Jasper, was it? It was Victoria. I was trying to protect you. By lying to me? He can't respond. There are no words to express his concern and frustration. A beat. Then she turns. Jake, wait up. Edward's hand is on her arm so fast she's barely moved. She turns to him with controlled anger. Edward, you have to trust me. I do. It's him I don't trust. Bella just looks at Edward, strong, independent, not about to a crease. Finally, he releases her. <laughs> she jogs to Jacob, climbs on the back of his bike. Jacob grins. Hold on tight. Lose the grin, Jake. We're just taking a ride. He kickstarts the bike, then roars off with Bella on the back. Edward watches them go off his apprehension. We are at Emily's house at day. Jacob pulls up. He and Bella climb off the bike. I don't think this is a good idea. You know I'm vampire girl. But the front door bursts open and Jared, Paul, Embry, and Quill pile out, shoving the last of a meal down their throats. Bella tenses, but much to her surprise and relief, Embry smiles when he sees her. <laughs> oh, it's me? <laughs> oh, dang it. Hey, look who's back. What up, Bella? Quill, you too? Yeah, me too. Glad you're back. Uh, you know, we'll finally get a break from Jake's obsessive inner monologue. I wish Bella would call. I wish Bella wouldn't call. Maybe I should call Bella. <laughs> I'll shut up now. Maybe I should call Bella and hang up. Maybe I should call Bella, say something, then hang up. I'm looking for a new pack. Any suggestions? Bella smiles at the guys laugh, push each other, rough house. Behind them, a slender girl with cropped black hair exits. Leah Clearwater, 19. She'd be gorgeous if not for her scowl. Leah sees Bella and the scowl deepens. Bella, this is Leah Clearwater, Harry's daughter. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry about your father. My dad really misses him. If you're here to torture Jacob some more, feel free to leave. Bella's taken back. Jacob shoots Leia in an angry look. She's impervious. A Sam and Emily accident, Leia abruptly moves off. Fun, isn't she? Emily gives Bella a hug. Sam offers a pleasant nod hello. Bella, I was wondering when we'd see your face around here again. So? She won't be getting through our line anytime soon. The guys ad-lib macho challenges as they make their way into the forest edge. Sam turns to Emily to say goodbye, looks into her eyes. Their connection is deeply intimate. As Sam gently kisses her, Bella politely looks away to see Bella's POV on Leah at the edge of the woods. Leah glances at Sam and Emily's kiss, then abruptly falls forward before her hands hit the ground. They become paws. Leah, now a light gray wolf, disappears into the woods. Off Bella's surprise, Exterior Jacob's house day. Jacob and Bella climb off the bike and start wheeling it toward the garage as. When did Leah, you know, around when her dad died? Her brother, Seth, also phased. He's only 15, one of the youngest we had. Sam keeps him home studying, but the kid's chomping at the bit. Wish it was Leah who'd stay home. Don't be such a guy. Not a chick thing. It's a love triangle thing. We all have to live with the Leah, Sam, Emily pain fest. Wolf telepathy, remember? Sam dumped Leah for Emily? It wasn't like that. Sam hates himself for hurting Leah, but Emily was the one. Yeah, I guess sometimes it chooses you. Jacob knows she's talking about Edward. Won't go there. More than some crush, Sam imprinted on Emily. Do I want to know what that is? Just one more thing we have no control over. Even our damn soulmates are chosen for us. Thanks to your blood-sucking buddies. Come on, you can't blame this on them. 
I sure as hell can. If we weren't wolves, we wouldn't imprint. And we wouldn't be wolves if the damn vampires would stay away, but they keep coming back. And when they do, you change. We lose everything. Our lives, our futures, our free will. You know, Quill imprinted on someone. Claire, she's two years old. Um, that's just creepy. No, <laughs> there's nothing romantic about it. It's a spiritual thing. All the same, Quill won't even date anyone for two decades until Claire catches up to him. Still a little creepy. I'm not getting it. He continues on in the garage. She follows Jacob's garage. Jacob and Bella enter. Jacob rolls the bike to its spot. She notes her old motorcycle in the corner collecting dust. It's like when you see her. As he finds his words, he slowly moves towards her. Everything changes. Suddenly it's not gravity holding you to the planet anymore. It's her. Nothing else matters. You would do anything, be anything for her. He's looking into Bella's eyes. She's afraid to ask, but... Sounds like you know the feeling. I do. Have you imprinted on someone? He weighs the loaded question. The truth versus what he wishes was the truth. She waits, emotions conflicting. Finally, he turns away, regret in his voice. You'd know it if I had. I just have a direct line to Sam and Quill's thoughts. She's relieved and confused at her relief. He picks up a wrench, tightening something on his bike as... So, for now, here's still you. You're still you. Yeah. Until... After graduation. Graduation? Jake, I told you it was gonna happen. Not in a month. Not before you've, you've even lived. Before I could, I could- Yeah, Rubbly throws his wrench across the garage. Hear it smash into the wall. <coughs> For a second, just a second, I thought, but he's got his hooks in you so deep. He didn't decide this, I did. And now you're gonna be that? They're not even alive, it makes me sick. Better you were really dead than one of them. You did not just say that. He's too angry to take it back. She heads for the door. Edward was right. This is a bad idea. Bella, I don't want... Please. She slows, turns back to him. He tries to calm himself. Oh, I'm going to try not to think about... I, I... Man. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. It takes a long, it takes a long beat for her to recover from the hurtful comment. Finally, she nods. She moves to her dusty motorcycle, brushes off the seat. We should stick to safer subjects, like motorcycles. Only thing safe about you on a motorcycle is when you turn it off. She smiles as does he. The tension slowly dissipates as they dust off the bikes, shifting back to friends mode. Interior of Bella's bedroom night, close on Bella's dream catcher as a man's hand moves into frame, turns it, include the man's back as he moves around the room, touching her stuff, picking things up, curious, setting them down just a little out of place. It's creepy. Finally, his, hands falls on, his hand falls on a red blouse striped over a chair. As he brings it to his nose, we see his face, it's Riley, pale white, chiseled features, eyes blood red, a vampire. He inhales Bella's scent, then stuffs it into his jacket and exits her room. We follow him down the stairs and into the living room. Riley soundlessly enters to find Charlie asleep on the couch. He's in uniform, a case file spread out, some of it resting on his chest. Riley leans over him, sees a photo of himself. It's his case file and a newspaper article. Serial murders rise in Seattle. Off Riley, intrigued, taking in the news and his own file, and Charlie, who's unaware of the danger, just inches away. Riley stares casually at Charlie's holster, silently, uncannily, smoothly, removes his gun, stares right down the barrel. Yup, there's a bullet. Riley points the gun at Charlie's head, smiles. This could be fun. How far can he pull the trigger without it going off? He squeezes, the hammer goes back. Then Riley notices the picture in Charlie's chest, his smiling human self reaches out to it. Interior Bella's house, living room night. Bella comes in the front door. The living room is empty and quiet, eerily so, suddenly. Edward could at least respect me old times. 
Bella turns, startled. Charlie leans in the kitchen doorway, indicating his watch. Actually, I was with Jake. Good. That's, that's good. There's a knock on the door. Charlie knows who it is, heads back into the kitchen with a small, self-satisfied smile. I'll give you two some privacy. Bella guard, guards herself, then opens the door to find Edward. Do you have any idea how worried I've been? I was perfectly safe. I nearly broke the treaty to make sure of it. Abruptly, he stops, inhales, his face alarmed. I know, I smell like dog. Something's wrong. He moves into the living room, darts throughout the first floor, checking it. Charlie doesn't see. He's concentrating on the photo of Riley, whose face has been scratched out. What? What is it? Stay here. And he bolts upstairs. He, she hurries after him. Bella's room, night. Bella enter, enters to find Edward holding the dream catcher. Edward, what's wrong? Someone was here. Interior Cullen House living room night. Edward paces, frustrated. Alice is stressed. Bella tries to track their fast-paced conversation with Carlisle, Rosalie, and em Esme. No, Alice, it was a stranger. I didn't recognize his scent. That's not helpful, Rosalie. Could you guys please, like, speak out loud? Sorry. A nomad passing through? Passerby wouldn't have left Bella's father alive. Bella's chilled by the thought. Esme wraps an arm around her just as the door bursts open. His scent disappeared about five miles south of Bella's house. Someone orchestrated this. Victoria. No, it has to be the Volturi. Checking to see if I've been changed? I don't think it was the Volturi either. I've been watching Arrow's decisions. We've got to find this fool and get some answers out of him. We also need to take shifts at Bella's house. God, another protection detail. Rosalie. She's right. You can't watch over me and dad and search for the intruder and for Victoria and keep yourselves fed. Your eyes are black. When's the last time you went hunting? You're already too busy protecting me. I'm not about to let you fend for yourself. I'm not about to let you starve. She stops. A beat. An idea occurring. She looks at him, a tiny glimmer of optimism fla flashing on her face. What? Exterior Bella's house, front yard day. Edward stands at the curb, frozen in place, waiting, eyes unblinkingly watching the front door. Finally, it opens. Bella exits. Behind her, Jacob. Edward meets them halfway. Edward is cool, calculating. Jacob, hot-headed, fractious. Whoever it was, he left a stick behind. It'll be hard to miss him when we cross it again. We'll handle it from here. We don't need you to handle anything or anyone. Jacob steps toward Edward, who doesn't move. I couldn't care less what you need. Bella moves between them. Great, so we'll all work together. Hey, we all have the same goal, right? To catch bad vampires. Like there's a distinction. Jacob, I feel that someday you and I are gonna have words. That's it. I. Bella tries to push them apart. It's like pushing boulders. Stop. Jacob simmers. Edward just looks at him. Just. Stop it. I'm tired of being in the middle of a territorial dispute between mythical creatures. From now on, I'm, I'm Switzerland, okay? Jacob starts to speak. I don't expect you guys to chuck a football around together. Fine, but we have a lot more problems. This is one temporary solution. Are you willing to at least try? A long, tense beat. Finally, Edward nods. Then Jacob. Right. So you need to coordinate, you know, schedules and stuff. Neither says anything. Bella sighs. Turns to Jacob. Would the pack prefer days or nights? Nights. Will days work for your family? Good. See, how hard was that? Agonizing. Off Bella determined to make this truce work. Bella's POV exterior Bella's house night. From above, looking down at the dark, silent forest beyond the yard, stillness. Suddenly, we see a movement in the trees, then two gleaming eyes peer out, belonging to a wolf skulking at the edge of the tree line. It looks up at Bella's bedroom, on Bella, night. She stands in the window, looking down at her protector, then in contrast to the danger that surrounds her. DW sent me and Eric our dorm assignments yesterday. 
Bella turns to the room where Angela lies on the floor, a massive stack of graduation announcements in the done pile. Angela is blithely unaware of Bella's situation. I'm in the furthest dorm from campus. Eric's in the closest, of course. Has Alaska signed you guys dorms yet? Bella looks at her, missing her already. She lies next to Angela, takes up a card to address. Not yet. Where's Edward tonight, anyway? Out looking for trouble. Angela hears the worry in Bella's voice, looks at her. Is something wrong? No, why? Well, one, Edward's always with you. Two, you keep looking out that window like you're hoping he'll show up with a mariachi band. Angela, what if Eric was like secretly a member of this violent gang and your brother was in this other gang and they they wanted to kill each other and you you couldn't tell anybody. Well, a slightly odd remark just kind of sits there. Oh, okay. It's okay. You don't have to talk about it. There's nothing to, I mean, there is, but. How can she talk about it? Bella debates, then sits up cross-legged, choosing her words carefully. Okay. You remember Jacob Black. Ah, Edward's jealous. You say that like it's so obvious. Oh, sorry, is it not? Edward just thinks Jacob's dangerous or something, a bad influence on me. Angela smiles, shakes her head. What? God, I've seen the way Jacob looks at you. Edward's seen it too, and he's only human. He's going to react like any other guy. Bella manages to curb her reaction. It's more complicated than that. Mm. Say the words, Bella. Jealousy. I've told Jacob how I feel. He accepts it. He'd rather be best friends than nothing. Oh, okay. So the words are <clears throat> denial. You're saying I'm an idiot. Eh, just a little oblivious. Well, I don't want this. Every move I make hurts someone. They're big boys. They can make their own choices. Don't worry. It'll work itself out. It's not life or death or anything. Off Bella, glancing back at her window, at her reality. Exterior Bella's house on the wolf, same. Off the wolf's eyes, eerily refracting the light. Road, day. Edward's silver Volvo pulls over to the side of the road. Bella and Edward emerge from the car. They see 30 yards down the road, a shirtless Jacob leaning against his red Volkswagen, waiting. The guys exchange a tense look. Doesn't he own a shirt? Bella looks at Edward a beat, realizing... Angela is a wise woman. What does Angela have to do with... You should go. No rush. I'm good here. Which doesn't make him feel better. He pulls her closer. I hate being away from you. Then he surprises her with a particularly passionate kiss. Down the road, Jacob scowls. Edward pulls away, leaving Bella a little dizzy. You could rush just a little... <laughs> He smiles. He offers a reassuring look and walks off. Angle on Jacob as Bella reaches him. He smiles broadly. Hey, beautiful. He pulls into a big hug. She hears Edward's car peel out. He's obviously pissed. As she watches the Volvo disappear, Jacob opens the car door. She takes her seat as... What do you want to do today? Bike, hike, hang. It's your call. But tonight, we're going to a very chill party. Off her curious look and the thunk of her car door closing, we are exterior la push behind Jacob's house at a bonfire nighttime. A group is gathered around the fire, eating hot dogs, laughing. Billy sits at the natural head of the circle. Old Quill, Quill's ancient grandfather, sits on one of him. What? Sits on one of him? Sits on one of them. Oh, sits on one side of him. <laughs> Sue Clearwater on the other. I was like, who's sitting on who? Um, the three council leaders. The whole pack is there. Paul, Quill, Ambry, Jared, and Sam, with Emily at his side. Leia suddenly stares into the fire. Meanwhile, a young Quilluit girl about Quill's age is definitely giving him the eye. He sighs, annoyed that in another life, he might be able to fulfill his promise as a Casanova. Across the sand, Jacob leads Bella toward a roaring fire. You sure this is okay? I hate being a party crasher. Technically, you're a council meeting crasher, but you're okay. I thought, I mean, they think it'll be good for you to hear the histories. Wait, the history, histories of the pack? Aren't they secret? We all got a role to play. You're a part of this. 
It's the first time Quill, Seth, and Leah are hearing them too, but you're the first outsider ever. Wow, I should have dressed better. Jake. They're interrupted by a gangly limb boy, Seth, 15, who trots up like a puppy. He clearly idolizes Jacob. About time you got here. Paul's been hoovering the grub, but I saved you some burgers. Good looking out, bro. Bella, this is Seth Clearwater, Leah's brother, newest member of the pack. Newest, brightest, bestest. Slowest. He grabs Seth in a headlock, the two tumble to the sand. Seth laughs, obviously, absolutely loving this guy. A whistle comes from the circle. It's Sam. Seth jumps up. Come on. Your dad's about to start. As Seth drags Jacob and Bella toward the bonfire. Quilliots have been a small tribe from the beginning. Exterior the push behind Jacob's house bonfire night, on the fire burning lower. We've always had magic in our blood. Include the circle, patting everyone's faces, their attention wholly on Billy, his voice commanding. We were great spirit warriors, shapeshifters who could transform into the powerful wolf. This enabled us to scare off our enemies and protect our tribe. On Bella, who absorbs the story, its images alive in her mind, Jacob glances at her, gauging her reaction as... One day, our warriors came across a creature. Interior forest clearing day, 1750s. Two Quileate warriors, all in human form, emerged from the trees, horrified to find a male vampire wearing the clothes of a mid-1700s Spaniard, spent over two lifeless tribe girls. His eyes are blood red, feral, a terrifying image. It looked like a man, but it was hard like stone and cold as ice. The two warriors phase into wolves and charge the vampire. He grabs one of them, strangling it. The second wolf gets his teeth into the vampire's neck and tears off its head. But the strangled wolf falls dead to the ground. Our warriors' sharp teeth finally tore it apart, but only fire would completely destroy it. Exterior La Push behind Jacob's house, bonfire night. Back on Bella, the horrible visuals alive in her mind. Jacob watches her, gratified by her somber reaction. They lived in fear that the cold man was not alone. They were right. Exterior Quilliot Village, day, 1750s. A beautiful vampiress in a tattered 1700 Spanish gown moves through the Quilliot Village of longhouses and teepees, a trail of dead bodies, tribespeople screaming. She took her vengeance on the villages. Our elder chief, Tahaaki, was the only spirit warrior left to save the tribe after his son was killed. Tahaaki. 60s, anguished, stands over his dead son, 20. His third wife, 40s, weeps inconsolably next to his body. Tahaaki spins towards the vampiress and takes a running lunge at her, transforming into a great wolf. They clash. The third wife watches with horror as the vampiress quickly gets the upper hand. uh, Tahaaki's third wife could see he would lose. The third wife pulls out a knife and runs toward the vampiress who barely acknowledges the impending attack. Back at La Push, back on Billy, who looks at Bella as he says, The third wife was no magical being, no special powers, but one, courage. On Bella's face as we go inside her thoughts. Exterior Quilliot Village Day, Bella's imagination. Magic at Bella's face now transformed into the third wife. Bella charges the vampire's dagger raised high, but as she nears, shockingly, she plunges the knife into her own heart. Blood flowers on Bella's chest. The vampire catches the scent and spins toward her, ravenous. The third wife's sacrifice distracted the cold woman long enough for Taaki to destroy her. She saved the tribe. As the Taaki wolf leaps into the vam- onto the vampire tearing her apart, Bella lay dying, her expression at peace. Over time, our enemies have disappeared, but one remains, the cold ones. Exterior La Push behind Jacob's house night, back on Bella. Emotions conflicting as she sees all this from the wolf's point of view. Bella, Billy continues. Our magic awakens only when they come near, and we sense it now. Feel the threat in our blood. Something terrible is coming. We must be ready, all of us. Off Bella and the fire. Seattle is in a state of terror. Interior Collins House Day, tight on a television screen turn, tuned to CNN. A female reporter with a mic does a stand-up in front of Pike Place. Police are baffled by the escalating murders and disappearances. Include Carlisle and Jasper who watch with concern. Emmett is draped over the couch. Bella and Edward enter as... Theories range from a vicious new gang to a widely active serial killer. Look who survived the dog park. 
Need something for those flea bit bites? I'm good, thanks. Seattle? It's getting worse. We're going to have to do something. Alice still hasn't had any visions about who's doing this. So we track him down and kick his bloodthirsty ass. Let's go now. I'm bored as hell. Emmett. Such, she's such a pessimist. Edward abruptly looks at Jasper, reading his mind a beat. I didn't think of that, but yes, it makes sense. Guys. Tell us, Jasper. As Jasper speaks, Bella is surprised when he continues beyond the one or two sentences he usually utters. His slight southern lilt becomes more obvious. Takes more than one of our kind to cause the damage they're reporting. Quite a few more. They're undisciplined, conspicuous. Newborns. Like new vampires? In their first months after the change. That's when we're at our most vicious, uncontrollable, insane with thirst. Something to look forward to. Bella blanches. No one has trained these newborns, but this isn't random. Someone's creating an army. Jasper nods. Emmett rises enthusiastic. Oh, now we definitely gotta go. Wait, an army of vampires? There haven't been any newborn armies in over a century that I know of. So there is now, and they've been created to fight someone. They're the only clan even close to Seattle. Regardless, if we don't put a stop to it, the Volturi will. I'm surprised they let it go on this long. Maybe they're purposely ignoring it. Or even behind it. When we were in Italy, I read it in Arrow's mind. Edward's vision, tracking toward Edward's face. As we enter his memory, his environment drops out. Blackness drop surrounding him, suspending him. As he turns, we go over his shoulder to see. He didn't want me to see, but it was there. He wants Alice and me to join him. Our gifts would shore up his power. A flash of Edward and Alice, each in one of the Volturi thrones, formerly occupied by Marcus and Caius. But he knows we'd never choose him as long as our family is alive. Back to Edward in the present day. An army could solve that for him. Bella takes this in, then? We can't wait two weeks for graduation. You need to change me now. You'd be a liability as a newborn. Unable to control your instincts. An easy target. Carlisle puts an empathetic hand on Bella's shoulder. There's also your father to consider, uh, and your mother. How terrible would it be for them if you suddenly disappeared? Bella can't argue, considers. Emma looks confused. But we are going to kick someone's ass, right? <laughs> Interior of Bannon Cannery, Seattle Harborfront night. Smash! A newborn vampire careens into the wall, cracking bricks. He falls to the ground at the feet of Riley, who spins on a second newborn. Next one who starts a fight gets his arm ripped off. Now get your own damn snacks. As Riley steps over a human man lying on the ground, barely alive, newborn number two watches hungrily as newborn number one dives on the man taking what's left of his life. Include another dozen newborns of genders, of both genders, all genders, all ethnicities and backgrounds who feed, lounge, fight, what they have in common is ferocity, strength, and thirst. Riley goes to a pretty girl, Bree, 15, who lies in a corner, just awakening. As he squats to check on her, she suddenly jumps up, backs against the wall, disoriented and profoundly thirsty. Her hand flies to her neck where she was bitten. What? What did you do to me? Behind Riley, the two newborn vampires start pushing each other again. They fight reigniting, irritating Riley. I'm so... So, yeah, I know. We'll find you someone to drink. The thirst will calm down after a while. I've got a year under my belt and I'm okay. Just then, newborn number one rips newborn number two's head completely off. Bree screams. Riley shakes his head, exasperated. He leaves Bree in confusion as he walks away off his face. Interior Bella's house kitchen night. On Riley's face, Xeroxed onto a flyer that reads, have you seen me? Include Charlie who sits at the table staring at it. Bella enters, dropping his back, her backpack, coat. 
Hi, Dad. You already eat dinner? Uh, n no, not not yet. She looks over his shoulder and sees the fire. Uh, Riley Bar Bar Bri Byers. Riley Byers. His parents are papered in Seattle with these. Fifth time they've tried. Do you think they should give up? Uh, I wouldn't if it was you. Not ever. Bella swallows her guilt. She was about to put him through that, and may still. Then he unexpectedly wraps an arm around her waist, pulling her close. After a beat, he releases her, rising to cover his emotionality. So, um, w one large extra cheese? I have to figure out what to tell people. Bella's room. Bella's cocooned in her bed in the dark. Edward lies next to her, her mother's quilt between them. How to explain why I won't be home for Christmases, why I won't visit, why they'll never see me again. After a few decades, everyone you know will be dead. Problem solved. She flinches at his brutal honesty, then faces him. Are you so against me becoming like you? I've told you. There's more to it. You can be honest. The choice you're making, I know the consequences of it. The loss, the isolation. I've lived it. To let you suffer that? And I know you believe I have a soul, but I don't. And to risk yours just so I'll never have to lose you, it's the most selfish thing I'll ever do. And I'm just as selfish. She rests her head on his chest. I thought maybe you were afraid I'll be too different or I won't be, you know, warm anymore. I won't smell the same. He lifts her face to his. You'll always be my Bella. And kisses her. She kisses him back. It grows more passionate. She locks her arms around his neck. Edward pulls away, both of them reigning in their desire. My Bella, just less fragile. He pulls the quilt around her as they nestle in. Camera pulls back until we're outside looking in the window. Still pulling back include the edge of the tree line where we find Emmett and Alice standing several paces apart, stone still, keeping watch, listening. They hear a sound, both spinning at once to find behind them two wolves, here to take over sentry duty. Slowly, Emmett and Alice back away, the wolves eyeing their every move. A truce, but a tense one. Exterior La Push Beach Day. Bella and Jacob walk along the sand. Jacob seems distracted, like he wants to say something but can't. Bella's too busy worrying to notice. They keep saying everything's fine, but it's complete bull. Alice is even going ahead with that stupid graduation party which I'm inviting you to, by the way. Yeah, I figured. The whole situation is a mess and I can't even help if I was one of them already. I wanna say something. Right, sorry, he agreed not to talk about that. No, it's, I wanted to do this differently, smoother, but I'm out of time and you need to hear the truth, understand all your options. You probably already know what I'm gonna say, but Jacob, don't. I'm in love with you, Bella, and I want you to pick me instead of him. Bella stares at him, momentarily speechless. Finally. Jake, I, I thought you understood. I, I don't feel that way about you. I don't buy it. What don't you buy? That's how I feel. Do you want me to go away? Never see me again? Of course not. See, you feel something else for me. You just won't admit it. And I'm not giving up. I'm going to fight for you. Yeah, until your heart stops beating. You won't have to fight long. You're rushing into it because you're afraid you'll change your mind. This strikes a nerve, which makes her angry. It's what I want. Jacob, Jacob takes her by the arms, emotionally charged. You wouldn't have to change for me or say goodbye to anyone. I can give you more than him. He probably can't even kiss you without hurting you. Feel that? Flesh and blood and warmth. Jacob. Suddenly, spontaneously, he kisses her. Bella <laughs> pushes against him angrily, but he pulls her tighter to him. Finally, Bella goes limp, drops her arms, opens her eyes, waiting for him to stop. He does. Let's go. She turns away. He waits, gauging her reaction. Did she feel what he felt? But Bella spins back toward him and punches him in the mouth. There's a horrible crunch on the impact. Jacob doesn't even flinch, but Bella grabs her hand in pain. 
Uh, oh my God, ow. <sighs> Why is your face so hard? <laughs> Exterior of Bella's house day. Bella pissed. Climbs from Jacob's car, holding her injured hand as Edward's vulva screeches to a stop. He gets out, moves directly for Jacob. Bella gets in his path. Not here, Edward. Please. He goes around Bella, getting directly in Jacob's face. If you ever touch her against her will again. He's not sure what her will is. Oh, she can speak for herself. I guarantee you. Fine. Someday she'll speak for herself and ask me to. Stop it, Jacob. Just go. But Jacob faces off with Edward. Behind them, Charlie exits, sees the hostility between them, heads for them. Okay, guys, hey, let's let's take it down a notch, okay? Come on, simmer down. The two guys could crush him, <laughs> but they back up. Now, what the hell is going on? I kind of kissed Bella. Oh. You can't help but be a little pleased. But the next bits of information change his attitude. Against her will. So she hit me and broke her hand. Accidentally. Charlie's expression turns into a glare that even the cocky Jacob shrinks under. Interior Cullen House kitchen evening. Edward looks on with concern as Carlyle finishes setting Bella's hand in a splint. Rosalie, at the counter in the background, peruses several newspapers looking for updates. Uh, it's just a small fracture. You're all set, Bella. Emmett and Jasper breeze in see Bella's splint. Trying to walk and chew gum at the same time again, Bella? Punch the werewolf in the face. Bad ass. <laughs> You're going to be one tough little newborn. Tough enough to take you on. Rosalie slaps down the newspaper and abruptly walks out, throwing a fierce scowl Bella's way. Bella's thrown. Don't worry about it. Did you find any leads? No sign of the intruder, but Victoria continues to make appearances. She's toying with us, keeping us distracted. From Seattle? Or the intruder, or something else. Alice can keep tracking her decisions, but we have to track her on the ground. Tired of being ignored, Bella heads out to the deck. Verdi covered the entire southern peninsula down to Quinault. We'll search the northwestern trail. Exterior Cullen House deck evening. Um, I'm just going to take a quick break here. Um, there is in the next section, just kind of like a um, trigger warning for anyone watching um, a sexual assault scenes. So I'm just putting that out there now just to warn anyone who might be triggered by that. But we are going to continue on. The sun sets over the river as Rosalie looks out. Bella exits. Rosalie knows who's behind her without looking. How blathered is someone else about the joys of becoming a newborn? I know how bad it will be. You don't have a clue. Now Bella's had it. She strains, pissed. Rosalie, I'm trying here. I've been trying with you, but I can't figure out what I did to make you hate me. Hate you? I don't hate you. I don't particularly like you, but Bella, I envy you. That's ridiculous. You have a choice. I didn't. None of us did. But you do, and you're choosing wrong. I don't care how miserable your human life is. Hey, life isn't miserable. It's not perfect, but no one's is. Mine was. It was a long time ago. Maybe you're forgetting the bad. I remember. And it was perfect, till the end. She turns toward the river again. Bella slowly moves to Rosalie's side, but at a careful distance. I had, almost had, everything. Even though it was the Great Depression, I was 18, beautiful. Everyone in Rochester envied me. We push in on Rosalie as. There's only one thing I wanted that I didn't have. Close on a baby's face. Curly black hair, dimples, cherubic. He's being held by Human Rosalie, Rocks, Rochester, New York, 1933. Rosy skin, stunning but naive, vain. We see her la longing as she hands the boy back to his mother, Vera, 18. I wanted a child badly. A home of my own, a husband to kiss me when he came home from work. And I thought I was going to have all of that. 
exterior of Rochester, New York streets, day. Rosalie walks on the arm of the handsome, well-dressed Royce King. Passers-by eye her ad admiringly. Royce enjoys the attention she brings him, but it's clear from their looks that Royce himself is not well-liked. Royce was the most eligible bachelor in town. I barely knew him. We were never alone, but I was in love with the idea of love. Rosalie doesn't see Royce eyeing a pretty woman across the street. The pretty woman, appalled, hurries along. He wipes the leer off his face. Rosalie blithely sees only her perfect man. I was young. Rochester, New York streets, night. Rosalie heads down the empty, lamplit streets. She pulls her coat close in, in the chill night air. On the last night of my life, I left a friend's house late. I wasn't far from home. She slows as she sees a group of five men gathered under a streetlight. They laugh drunkenly, passing a bottle. Rosalie veers away to avoid them, but then hears. Rose, we've been waiting for you. Rosalie relaxes a little as he realizes it's Royce. Royce, you're drunk. Isn't she lovely, John? Told you she was a looker. Pete, that's you. Uh, hard to say with all those clothes on. Rosalie, uncomfortable, looks to Royce, but he just snickers. Show him what you look like, Rose. Take off a few layers. I'll see you tomorrow. Sober. She starts off, but Royce abruptly yanks her hat off. She cries out in pain as the hat pins wrench her hair out. Royce grins, the sadist in him unmasked now. The men laugh. You'll do as I say. Then he grabs her coat. She fights him, scratching his face, but he violently rips the coat off her. Extreme close-up on the brass buttons. They pop off in slow motion, and we follow the buttons as they scatter onto the street. I didn't see who he was until that night, who they all were. We're back at the Cullen house, the deck, in the evening. Bella reels at the horror of Rosalie's assault. Empathy fills her as a stoic Rosalie continues. They left me in the street, thinking I was dead, believe me. I wanted to be. Carlisle found me, smelled all the blood. He thought he was helping me. I'm so sorry that happened to you. But Rosalie won't be pitied. I did get revenge on them, one at a time. I saved Royce for last, so he'd know I was coming. We flash to interior hotel quarter night back at, in 1933. Two large men guard the doorway to a room. They look up as a specter in white appears at the other end of the hall. As it nears, we realize it's Rosalie in her wedding dress. Interior hotel room night. Royce is terrified as he hears the sound of the two guards' bodies falling heavily to the ground. He backs into a corner. The door splinters open and Rosalie enters. Off Royce's horror as she closes in on him. Back on Rosalie present. I was a little theatrical back then. A flash of amusement, but it quickly disappears. Things got better after I found Emmett, but we'll always be this, frozen, never moving forward. That's what I miss. The possibilities of sitting on a front porch somewhere, Emmett gray-haired by my side, surrounded by our grandchildren, the laughter. Rosalie is silent a beat. Bella turns to her, empathetic, but holding her ground. I understand that's what you wanted, but there'll never be anything I want more than Edward. Wrong again. After you've been changed, there's one thing you'll want more. One thing you'll kill for. Blood. Seeing her point has landed, Rosalie walks off. Bella, shaken, turns back toward the house. and We see Edward standing in the window, looking out at her. When we were five, they asked us what we wanted to be when we grew up. Interior Forks High School gym, graduation ceremony day. Camera pans across the caps and gowns, families and teachers. Umbrellas are on hand in case the clouds open up. Our answers were things like astronaut, president. When we find Jessica at the podium, class valedictorian. Or in my case, princess. <laughs> when we were 10, they asked again, and we answered, rock star, cowboy, or in my case, gold medalist. But now that we've grown up, they want a serious answer. Well, how about this? Who the hell knows? Loud hoots and hollers from the audience into which we find Bella. 
Jessica's words are sinking in. This isn't the time to make hard and fast decisions. It's the time to make mistakes. Take the wrong train and get stuck somewhere. Chill. Fall in love a lot. Major in philosophy because there's no way to make a career out of that. Change your mind, then change it again. Because nothing is permanent. Off Balan, knowing there will be no changing her mind once she makes her decision. The speech continues over. Interior high school gym, graduation ceremony day. On the stage, Bella walks to the school principal and shakes his hand while receiving her diploma. Out in the audience, Charlie claps loudly, beaming with pride. So make as many mistakes as you can. That way, someday, when they ask again what we want to be, we won't have to guess. We'll know. Exterior school, post-graduation ceremony day. Charlie and Bella walk away, Bella awkwardly shouldering out of her gown and mortarboard. ad lib see you at the parties, with various students, including the usual suspects, if possible. Charlie wraps an arm around Bella's shoulder, emotional. I'm so proud of you, Bells. I, I, I can't wait to see what you do next. You're my biggest accomplishment. That's not true, Dad. Yeah, it is. And, it, and it's, well, you'll see when you have kids. Off Bella. What did I say about low profile? Exterior Seattle, isolated street night. Riley, exasperated, stands next to a late model sedan that lies upside down in the dark street. Smoke comes from the engine, a fire ignites. Inside the car, a woman screams. You call this low? A male newborn ignores him as he pulls the screaming woman from the car and begins to feed on her. Nearby, two other newborns feed on pri prizes of their own. A sex worker and a bike messenger, Riley gives up. Just clean up after yourselves. Camera cranes up and back to an overpass in the distance where we find four people, utterly motionless, looking down at the mayhem. Push in to find, they're the Volturi. Jane with her misleadingly angelic face, the hulking Felix, elegant Dimitri, and cherubic Alec. All wear dark coats with hoods. Jane is calling the shots. How indiscreet. <laughs> they've, they've already drawn too much attention. So there's our inaction. Others may begin to question the Walteri's effectiveness. Let them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should consult Arrow. Jane shoots Felix a look. Searing pain shoots through his body. The massive Felix drops to the ground, writhing silently. <laughs> 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 <gasps> Silently. <laughs> Jane is one scary little girl. Arrow's decisions are being watched. We must decide. Alec carefully, gently touches her shoulder, interceding. Then decide, sister. It's time. She releases Felix. Dimitri helps him up. She smiles at Alec, utterly uncaring of the agony she just caused Felix. Yes, it is. Either we let them do what they were created for, or we end them. Decisions, decisions. Back on Riley, he senses something, looks up. Riley's POV on the overpass, the Volturi are gone. We begin to hear the pounding of dance music as we go to a break. Um, so we will be going on a five minute break. Uh, Sam, if you could switch to the intermission, um, slide, uh, currently 1226. Let's meet back here at 1231.
All right, and we are back. We are Interior Collins House graduation party night. It's wall-to-wall -wall teenagers dancing, celebrating. Alice has transformed the place into a magical nightclub. Angle on the front door as Bella enters, immediately overwhelmed by the crowd. She weaves her way through the throng, searching for Edward. She finally spots him through the kitchen door. Edward is deep in consultation with Carlisle, Emmett, and Jasper. Their mood is intense. Bella heads toward them, but Jessica and Angela swoop in. You're finally here. What'd you think of my speech? Too easy breezy, self-helpful. Actually, you pretty much nailed it. Like I was born to leave, right? Oh, I love this song. Come on. She pulls them to the dance floor where Eric and Mike find them. Time to dance, Bella. Don't make me get my robot on. You wish your robot was as good as mine. 
Everyone please look at Steven. <laughs> Mike and Eric start a robot battle. The girls laugh. Their celebratory mood is in striking contrast to the atmosphere in the kitchen. A dance floor is Bella's idea of hell, but she forces a smile, shuffles a bit. Then she sees on the front door, Jacob enters calm, confident. Quill and Embry flank him, looking tense, eyes darting around the room. Bella maneuvers off the dance floor and into Jacob's path. Ah, oh, what are you doing here? You invited me, remember? Oh, was my right hook too subtle? Because that was me uninviting you. Bella, I'm sorry about, you know, the kiss and your hand. And I blame it on the whole inner animal thing, but it was just me being an ass. Really, I'm sorry. She sees he's sincere. She softens, nods. I brought you a graduation present, made it myself. He takes her hand and clasps to her wrist a charm bracelet. The charm, an intricately hand-carved figurine of a miniature wolf. Bella looks at it, moved. It's beautiful. You made this? Wow, I... Thank you. Jacob's pleased, but then Bella's eyes caught by Alice standing by the staircase, frozen. She's having a vision. Alarm clouds, alarm clouds Bella's face. Jacob sees it. I'll be right back. Why? What's going on? Nothing, just uh, wait here a sec. Jacob shares a suspicious look with Embry and Quill as Bella pushes through the crowd. On the staircase, Bella reaches Alice just as she comes out of her vision, her face alarmed. Alice, what is it? What did you see? Jacob appears. Okay, something is going on. Tell me. I, I need to talk to Jasper. Jacob puts an arm against the wall, blocking her. Why don't you talk to me? Suddenly Jasper is there. His expression lethal. I suggest you remove your arm before I do. Jacob does so slowly, carefully. Just looking for info. Decision's been made. You're not going to Seattle, are you? No. They're coming here. Off, Alice. We smash to Alice's vision. Seattle, abandoned cannery. Riley passes Bella's red blouse amongst the newborns as they inhale, picking up her scent exterior Cullen House back deck night. The party continues inside, but outside, the discussion is tense. Bella, Alice, Edward, Jasper, and Carlisle debate as Jacob tries to follow. Quill and Embry are nearby, on guard. How long? They'll be here in four days. <sighs> this could turn into a bloodbath. There aren't enough of us to protect the town. Someone's going to attack force? Who's behind it? I didn't see anyone familiar, maybe one. Yes, I've seen his face, he's local, Riley Byers. He catches Bella's eye as she recognizes the name, Shaken. But he didn't start this. Whoever did is staying out of the action. So someone's playing with blind spots in your vision. Only the Volturi could know how Alice's gifts work. Arrow would have, would have found out when he read Alice's mind. Well, either way, the army is coming and our odds aren't good. All right, hold up. What damn army? He's about to explode. Carlisle and Edward share a look. Edward shakes his head no, but Carly di Carlisle decides differently. Our kind. Newborns. How many? <laughs> <Enough. No. laughs> what are they after? They were passing Bella's scent around. A, a red blouse? That's what he was doing at my house. Okay, what the hell does this mean? It means an ugly fight with lives lost. The weight of it lands on all of them, feet. Jacob shares a sober look with Embry and Quill, an imperceptible nod. We're in. What? No, you get yourself killed. Please, it's what we were made for. Forget it. Wasn't asking permission. All right. The guys back off, Carlisle turns to. You believe Sam will agree to this understanding? That's a fancy word for fighting together. Yeah, we happen to live here too. Mm. Edward looks at Carlisle's who's still weighing it. Jasper. They'll give us the numbers and newborns won't know werewolves even exist. That'll give us an edge. Carlisle, don't. They'll get hurt. Jacob scoffs. They all look to Carlisle. Finally, he nods. We'll have to coordinate. Edward's not happy, but resigns himself. Bella is panicked. Fighting newborns requires knowledge that Jasper has. 
We were already planning a strategic meeting. Uh, you're welcome to join us. Name the time and place. Interior Cullen House party, a minute later. Jacob, Quill, and Embry head for the door. Bella catches Jacob. Jake, wait, you don't know what you're getting into. It's what we do. You should be happy. Look at, you. Look at us, working together. You're the one who wanted us to get along. And Jacob strides out, leaving her amid the revelers. As the music grows louder, push in on Bella's worried face. Exterior clearing in woods, dawn. The eerie silence contrasts the previous scene's noise. It's a large field surrounded by dense forest. The mist is heavy. It's overcast, gray. Suddenly, the quiet is broken by Emmett being flung through the air, flailing in slow motion. Mm -hmm. He lands hard on his back, but immediately springs up to face Jasper, the person who threw him. Again. Include Carlisle, Esme, Alice and Rosalie, who watch them spar, angle on an arriving Volvo as it skids to a halt next to Jasper's Jeep. Edward and Bella climb out, head into the field together. Halfway across, Edward stops. They're here. On the tree line, from out of the mist, skulk eight giant wolves as wary and on edge as the Cullens are. Emmett recognizes Paul Wolf. Their eyes meet, both itching for a rematch. Two more have joined the pack. Very young. Very young. Carlisle joins Edward as he reads the pack's mind. They don't trust us enough to be in human form. But they're here, and that's what matters. Bella sees the red brown wolf as it turns toward her. Jake. He seems to almost smile, tongue lolling. A sharp look from Sam Wolf gets Jacob Wolf to focus. Carlisle asks Edward. Will you translate? Edward nods. Carlisle moves slowly toward the pack. Sam Wolf, the biggest and blackest, steps forward. Welcome. He says they'll watch and listen, but that's the most we can ask of their self-control. That will be fine. Jasper has experience with newborns. He'll teach us how to defeat them. They want to know how these newborns differ from us. Well, they're a great deal stronger than us because their own human blood lingers in their tissues. Our kind is never more physically powerful than in our first several months of this life. The pack takes this in. Carlisle nods to Jasper to take over. Jasper is initially uncomfortable with both the wolves and the attention, but steps forward. Carlisle's right. That's why newborns are created for armies. One of them, Quill. He wants to know how many vampires constitute an army. He seems to be made nervous by the term. If it's possible for a wolf to look embarrassed, Quill does. Jasper laughs. Army is an expression for a large number of newborns. The good news is that they are not in the thousands like human armies. But the bad news is no human army could stand against them, but they're untrained and their thirst will make them wild, volatile. That can work in our favor. As Jasper moves to the center of the field for a demonstration, he grows more commanding, the long dormant leader in him resuming control. Bella watches with surprise as this new Jasper emerges. The pack sit or lay to observe, ready to spring if need be. The two most important things to remember are first, never let them get their arms around you. They'll crush you so fast your head will spin. Second, never go for the obvious kill. They'll be ready for that and you'll lose. Emmett, don't hold back. Not in my nature. Emmett charges Jasper with impossible speed, but Jasper is a virtual blur. Emmett lunges several times, his strong arms grabbing at air. Jasper stops long enough to say, You have to come at them from the side and keep moving. Always moving. Emmett lunges again with a similar result until suddenly he freezes. Jasper has him from behind, his teeth an inch from Emmett's throat. Bella is taken back by Jasper's skill, and there's an impressed rumble among the watching wolves. Training sequence... A series of shots. Everyone takes turns sparring with Jasper or pairing off against each other. They're all blurs which become visible as we shift to slow motion to see a violent but extraordinary dance. Alice and Jasper spar, spiraling, twisting. Jasper launches at her but with her eyes glazed over, not looking at him, she sees his moves before he makes them. Out of nowhere, Alice is perched on his back. She kisses his neck. Gotcha. Edward and Carlisle attack one another, but Edward can read Carlisle's mind, which gives him the advantage. He twirls to, uh, beyond Carlisle's grasp and slams into him, delivering a vicious body blow. Focus on speed, agility. Keep your opponent off guard. The wolves rise or pace, watching intently, itching to get into the fray, but holding back. Use their momentum against them. Yes, good. Angle on Bella, anxiously watching these fierce life and death war games, a portent of the violence to come. 
A furry muzzle brushes her face. Jacob Wolf is beside her, his eyes conveying concern. She pensively looks back out at the field. It will be a hundred times worse than this, won't it? Bella's view will be patting across the faces of the columns and the walls. Some of you might not be here afterward because of me. A beat, then Jacob nuzzles her face again. She pets him, leans against him. We're done for the day. Edward has suddenly reappeared next to her. His expression is calm, but firm. Jacob Wolf eyes them, then rejoins his pack as they retreat into the woods. Exterior c- clearing in the woods later that day. The jeep pulls away, carrying Carla, Esme, Rosalie, and Emmett. Bella sits on the hood of the Volvo. Jasper approaches, kicking the mud from his shoes, brushing dirt off. Bella looks at him as if for the very first time. Jasper, is there anything I can do to help? Well, your presence alone, your scent will distract the newborns, sir. Hunting instinct will take over, drive them crazy. Good. I'm glad. How do you know so much about all this? I didn't have quite the same fine upbringing as my adopted siblings. Hoping to end the conversation, he starts to move away, but she jumps off the jeep following him. He pauses, sees her inquiring look, beat. He slowly rolls up a sleeve, shows her... Bella's POV close on Jasper's arm. At first, we see nothing in the overcast gray light. Then it becomes clear. His arm is feathered with hundreds of white half-moon-shaped scars. Bella is aghast. Those are bites. Like mine. Battle scars. All the training the Confederate Army gave me was useless against newborns. Still, I never lost a fight. This is during the Civil War? He nods as he starts to walk. She walks a pace with him. I was the youngest major in the Texas Cavalry, all without ever having seen real combat until... Until? Until I crossed paths with a certain immortal, Maria. Off Jasper's face, darkening the past. Exterior desert outside Houston, Texas, night. Match cut Jasper's human face, tan and flushed with the exertion of riding his horse full throttle down the dirt road. He looks dashing in his Confederate uniform. I was riding back to Galveston after evacuating a column of women and children when I saw her. He slows when he sees three women in frayed dresses and bare feet. Their beauty overwhelms him. Maria, Mexican, black-haired, porcelain-skinned, is flanked by two blondes, Lucy and Nettie. He dismounts, politely bows. Maria scrutinizes him. Southern gentleman that I was, I immediately offered her aid. Hmm, lovely. And then I like a sir. You'd better do it, Maria. I can never stop once I've started. Jasper is confused, but mesmerized as Maria moves closer. What's your name, soldier? Major Jasper Whitlock, ma'am. I hope you survive. You'd be an excellent addition. Exterior clearing in the woods day. Back on Jasper, who stops walking, the painful memory washing over him. Bella moves to a fallen log, sits, prompts him. Maria was creating an army? I became her second in command. Back then, armies were common in the South. There were constant, brutal battles for territory. Exterior Texas desert night in the 1860s. Match cut Jasper's face, eyes red. He's almost unrecognizable in his ferocity as he tears through an opposing army of newborns, ripping off limbs, arms, and heads. He's a terrifying warrior. Maria won every battle. She was smart and careful, and she had me. My ability to control emotions served her well. Interior barn day, late 1800s. Jasper trains a group of newborns demonstrating defensive and attack maneuvers. They're a feral looking bunch. Jasper's eyes are burgundy red, his face hard, cold, until he crosses a young, innocent looking boy, 15. Jasper softens ever so slightly as he encourages the boy who clearly looks up to him. I trained her newborns, an endless occupation since she never let them live beyond their first year. A stronger newborn easily pins the boy. Maria appears behind Jasper, grabs him into a kiss, dominant and salacious. She whispers to him regarding the boy. It was my job to dispose of them. Interior born night. Jasper approaches the boy who looks up and smiles at his friend and mentor. So he's surprised when Jasper throws an arm around his throat. I could feel everything they felt. See Jasper's despair as he restrains the boy in a chokehold, almost an embrace before twisting the boy's head off. Exterior clearing in the woods day, we're back on Jasper, his despair as acute as if it was yesterday. Alice has appeared next to him. I thought what Maria and I had was love, but I was just a puppet. She pulled the strings. I didn't know there was another way until I found Alice. She seemed coming. 
schools. Kept me waiting long enough. My apologies, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I'd have to become. I don't know what I'd have become without her. Alice wraps her arms around Jasper from behind him. Shh. You'll never have to be that again. Alice tries to kiss the ghosts away, off Bella taking it all in. Exterior Bella's house at night. Push in on the second story, Bella's darkened window. Dream sequence. Find Bella back in the field, only now she's alone. Camera circles around her until it's over her shoulder and we see Jasper in front of her. Then Maria steps next to Jasper, whispers seductively into his ear. We don't hear it, but we push in on clo close on Jasper's eyes. They begin to turn bright Blood red, thirst craved. Pull out again to discover that it's no longer Maria next to him. It's Victoria. She lunges for Bella, but for once, instead of running, she faces her enemy and swings back in Bella's room. On Bella in bed, mid-swing, Edward catches her fist. She was dreaming, but the fist was real. Her eyes focused, realizing she swung at Edward. Her heart is racing. The intruder, the newborn army, they're, they're all her puppets. Victoria. Alice would have seen Victoria's decision to make an army. Unless she's hiding behind them, letting someone else decide. Maybe she found out how Alice's vision works. Edward rises, considering. Trust me, I want it to be her. I, I want her that close to end her myself with my own hands. She sees the darkness in his face, not certain what to make of his murderous side. Exterior Seattle under a bridge, night. It's dark. Riley appears in the shadows, dragging by the collar a barely conscious athletic young man, Tristan, 18. Riley effortlessly pulls Tristan's weight behind him as he traverses the long stretch of the underpass. On Tristan's face, he tries desperately to focus. The bump on his head prevents lucidity. Stop. I... But he's dragged over a stone, cries out in pain. Riley ignores him, finally reaching his destination. He releases Tristan, who drops hard to the ground. Tristan's blinded by the darkness, dazed, terrified. He starts to crawl away. He doesn't see a pair of boots step up behind him. He manages to get, his, get to his feet, about to run, but suddenly a hand wrenches him backward, and it's Victoria. She forces him to his knees, his back to her. Note, Tristan never sees Victoria. She shoots a smile at Riley. He returns it, backing away from the coming blood. She yanks Tristan's head to the side to expose his neck. Welcome to the army. We're ready. Exterior Bella's house day. Edward exits with Bella on his heels. Wait. I'll be here soon, Bella. I know. That's why I... I wanted to ask you something. You'd give your life for me, wouldn't you? course. What else would you give? Anything. Good. And I feel better about asking you this. I want you to stay out of the fight. I can't, Bella. I can't lose you. I won't be far. And it will be over quickly. With the wolves in it, there won't be enough for the rest of us to do. If there won't be enough to do, then you're not needed, are you? Edward seems caught by his own logic. Hmm. <laughs> and it's just pride that's making you go well I'm asking you to put that aside <laughs> know that it would take a lot of courage no more tricks no more half truths we'll be together one way or another either you come with me or I'll be at the battle with you Edward struggles no she's right but resists. She sees he's wavering. She presses, reluctantly saying the words she knows will land hardest. Edward, I've already gotten crazy once. If you leave me again. Yep, those were the words that could evoke his guilt. He looks down. She feels terrible, but doesn't take it back. There are only two alternatives. Both of us in or both of us out. Edward struggles with his conscience, loses. Then I choose the alternative I can live with. He pulls her to him, off Bella, both relieved and guilty. Exterior clearing in the woods day, Jacob faces Edward and Bella. They're in the center of the field. Jasper stands several paces behind Edward. You're not fighting? What, you pull a muscle or something? He's doing it for me, okay? Jacob looks at her, at Edward, shakes his head with disdain. Whatever, just tell me the plan. Jasper steps forward slightly. This field will give us an advantage in battle. 
We can lure the newborns with Bella's scent, but it needs to end here. Edward and I are going to a campsite, but even if he carries me, they'll still pick up our scents. Your smell, however, is revolting. Dude, you really don't want to start comparing stinks. He means your scent will mask mine if you carry them. This is a bad idea. Edward, they won't want to get anywhere near his odor. Let's just test it. Edward finally nods. She extends her arms to Jacob. He grins, picks her up, holding her tight. Oda Wolf coming up. Run! Exterior force day. Jacob runs through the trees carrying Bella. Not superhuman speed, but fast. And not breaking a sweat. Some time has passed, possibly indicated by cuts. And Jacob sets Bella down. They start to walk, circling back slowly toward their distant starting point. We'll see if that works. Personally, I think I smell great. You ever notice anything? Nothing except the usual boy smell. You gonna ask me to sit out of the fight too? Or don't you care about my safety? Of course I care, but you'd say no. Unless maybe you'd consider. Yeah, right. But that doesn't mean he loves you more. And I, I don't have a choice anyway, since I let Sam be alpha. I have to live with the shots he calls. Wait, you let him be alpha? What does that mean? Technically, I was supposed to be Alpha. It's a lineage thing. It also would have meant being chief of the whole tribe, but I turned it down when Sam offered. You're kidding. I didn't want to be in a pack, let alone be their leader. Wow. Chief Jacob. Opted out, but every choice has consequences, some more than others. Don't start. You're going to have to accept my choice. Jacob stops. Their proximity intimate. Hot potato, if you know, if you, you know. <laughs> yes. You can love more than one person at a time. I've seen it with Sam, Emily, and Leah. I'm not a wolf. I can't imprint. It's not about imprinting. It's about feeling something for someone. And I know you feel something for me. I can sense how I make you feel physically. I make you nervous. Jacob pulls her closer. Indeed, making her a little nervous. Jake, come on. Why? I promised I wouldn't kiss you again until you asked. We'll be keeping that promise a long time, Chief Jacob. <sighs> he sees he's gone to her, <laughs> grins. Exterior clearing in the woods, day. Back on Edward as Jasper jogs out of the woods. All I picked up was wolf stench. No, Bella, this will work. Great. Exterior Bella's house afternoon. Bella climbs from her truck just as Alice exits. Sorry, my Siri just came on. Stop. Stop it. <laughs> <clears throat> as I was saying. Exterior Bella's house afternoon. Bella climbs from her truck just as Alice exits the house with Charlie. The two laugh, enjoying one another. As Alice heads down the stairs. Don't be a stranger, Alice. Hi, Bells. Bella, surprised, waves back as Charlie heads into the house. Alice meets Bella. A Bella in the yard. A Bella. Your alibi for the battle is all arranged. Really? I told your father that my whole family is going camping this weekend. So you and I are having a sleepover at my house. Me? He likes. Actually, you and I will have the house to yourselves tonight. Alone? We're all going hunting. Powering up for the fight. You're welcome. Half Bella, flushed with anticipation and nerves. Interior Bella's house kitchen afternoon. Bella enters as Charlie makes a sandwich. He looks up. Sister I like. Yeah, Alice is great. She moves to the sink, starts washing dishes. Overly casual. So, Dad, I was wondering why you <laughs> never got remarried after Mom. <laughs> I don't know. Guess I never met the right person. Why? I thought maybe it's because you, I, I don't know, gave up on the whole institution of marriage, but you still think it has value? Sure, marriage has value. When you're older, much older, like, you, you, like your mom worked out great for her second time you know, later in life. <laughs> I guess. You definitely don't want to have, have to be married because you weren't careful. What? I mean... The, there are things you need to know when you're 
physically intimate? Oh, no. Oh, don't. Tell me you're trying to give me the talk. I, I'm, I'm just as embarrassed as you are. I seriously doubt that. And mom beat you to it 10 years ago. You didn't have a boyfriend 10 years ago. I think things still work the same. So you two are taking precautions? Oh, please. I mean, really, please don't worry about it. Edward is old school. I don't know. I don't know what that is. That like a, a technique or. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm a virgin. Okay. And oh, I cannot believe I just had to say that out loud. Really? Neither can he. Yeah. No. Huh. <laughs> like in Edward a little more. Bella mortified bolts for the door. Exterior Cullen has a night. Bella approaches the front door, overnight bag on her shoulder. She's nervous, awkward. She arranges her hair, straightens her sweater, checks her breath. The door suddenly opens to reveal Edward, worried. Why are you waiting out here? What's wrong? Nothing. He looks at her quizzically, but takes her bag, shows her in. She takes a deep breath and enters. Interior Edward's bedroom night. Bella follows Edward into the room to find a large, luxurious, wrought iron bed. She stops at the sight of it. There's a bed. I thought you might need one to sleep in. She tentatively moves to it, sitting on its edge. A blow-up mattress would have sufficed. Too much? <laughs> no, perfect. Inhaling courage, she scoots to the bed center. Beat. I want to ask you something. He sees something's on her mind, joins her on the bed. Anything. Is marriage still a condition to agreeing to change me yourself? Yes. Okay, well, I want to negotiate my own, you know, condition. There's something else you want? It's yours, whatever it is. Bella looks at him, then leans over, kisses him. Awkwardly, she moves closer still, kisses him again, more deeply. He returns the kiss, passion sweeps over them. But as she attempts to unbutton his shirt, he pulls back, realizing. Bella, uh, no, I could hurt you. You said you wanted me to have every human experience. Oh. The ones that don't risk me killing you. You won't, and everyone's so convinced that after I've changed, all I'll want is to slaughter the town and- That part- doesn't last forever. I want to be with you while I'm still me, while I want you this way. It's too dangerous. Try. I'll marry you, go to college, let you buy me a car, just try. He sees how important it is to her, wrestles with his own conflicting desires, a difficult internal debate. Please. She sees he's on the fence. She tentatively moves closer, kisses his forehead, his cheek, his lips. He allows himself to kiss her back and he keeps going. Passion builds again. She successfully tugs his shirt off. Bare chested, he pulls her closer. They fall, fall back on the bed, but when she tries to take off her own shirt, he finally pulls back, trying to retrieve his wits. Bella, Bella, please stop trying to take your clothes off. Do you want to do that part? <laughs> Not tonight. She shrinks back, utterly humiliated, rejected. You don't want to. Wow. Okay, that's... He quickly moves to her side, grabs her up, pulling her close, intense desire in his eyes. Oh, I, I want to. More than you can possibly imagine. But I want us to be married first. He kisses her hand. Bella's trying to sort this out. What am I, like some perv trying to steal your virtue? It's not my virtue that concerns me. You can't be serious. I'd like to leave this one rule unbroken. It may be too late for my soul, but I will protect yours. I know it's, it's not a very modern notion. It's not even old fashioned. It's ancient. I'm from a different era. Things were less complicated. For instance, I was considered a man at 18. Had I met you then... He slides off the bed, still holding her hand, pushed in on Bella's face as... I'd have courted you and called on you at home. 
we'd have taken chaperone strolls or had iced tea on the front porch. I might have even stolen a kiss or two. And after asking your father's permission, I'd have gotten down on one knee. And you are now on one knee. And offered you a ring. As he takes from his pocket a little black box and flips it open to reveal the sparkling ring, a long oval face with slanting rows of glittering stones set within a fragile wealth of gold. This was my mother's. The beautiful ring literally takes Bella's breath away. Edward pulls her to her feet as he remains on his knee. Fear and love do battle within her as... I would have said, Isabella Swan, I promise to love you every single moment of forever. Will you do me the extraordinary honor of marrying me? As he slips the ring on her finger, she is overcome. Tears spring to her eyes as finally love wins out. Yes, yes, I will. He rises overjoyed and embraces her, lifting her off her feet. He is joyous. She reels, overwhelmed, ambivalence not entirely gone as she takes in the ring on her figure. Interior Seattle abandoned cannery night on Riley and Victoria and in an embrace, a dark, discomfitting mirror image of the previous scene. They're on a secluded catwalk away from the newborn army. It's sexy, intimate. You're not coming with us. It will be a last minute decision. I told you how it works. <laughs> right. The Cullens have powers. Victoria pulls away ever so slightly irritated by his tone. Don't underestimate them, Riley. You'll have the numbers, but they'll be able to anticipate your every move. According to your friend. She looks at him, not sure where he's going with this. She circles him. Yes, my dead friend. Laurent found out about the things they could do and they killed him, but not before he told me. And maybe he was wrong. I mean, this is supposed to be the Colin's territory, but we've been tearing it up and I've never seen them here. Yuri flashes in Victoria's eyes. She's suddenly standing several feet away from him. You don't trust me. With my life. I'm just saying that. I'm doing this for us so we can feed without retaliation. I can't live in fear anymore, waiting for them to attack. He's suddenly next to her, wrapping his arms around her. I won't let them. I'm going to end the calling clan. I swear. She looks at him, then kisses him hard. I love you so much. He embraces her, but over his shoulder, we see her eyes go flat the emotion disappearing. Exterior trail in the woods morning, close Bella's finger, sounds ring. A pin pricks it and a single drop of blood appears. Include Bella who touches her finger to the side of a tree. She moves up the trail to the next tree, touching it as well. A cold wind blows, the clouds above are dark. She continues making her way to the clearing, morning. Bella emerges into the empty field. She touches another tree, Edward comes up behind her. Going overboard. This is all I can can contribute, I want to be thorough. Jasper will be very impressed and the newborns will be frantic. Now let me put a bandage on that. He reaches for her left hand. She pulls it away, worried. I can do it. You don't have to make yourself uncomfortable. Don't worry, this doesn't bother me anymore. Since when? As, she, as he takes her hand, puts a bandage on it. Since I survived thinking you were dead. He continues to hold her hand, gives her a quizzical look. You're not wearing your ring. I didn't want to risk losing it. Or letting Jacob see it? It would be better if I told him, you know, later, after tomorrow's fight. If you're having second thoughts. No, I just want him to have a clear head. Whose head is unclear? They spin to find Jacob across the clearing. He approaches. <laughs> no one's, I hope. Edward and Jacob nod curtly to one another. Jacob eyes the cloudy sky. Edward does the same. Alice says there's a storm coming. I can feel it. We should get going. I'll take a longer route, but I'll get there first. Set up camp. Jacob nods. Edward turns to Bella, searching her face for ambivalence or surety. Finally, he kisses her forehead. I'll see you in a few hours. He grabs her bag and some gear, leaves. Jacob eyes Bella. Something up? The usual. <laughs> Bunch of vampires trying to kill me. Same old, same old. They share a smile as he slings her onto his back. 
Exterior abandoned lumber yard on the water. Day. Bradley leads the army of newborns across this ghostly yard. They move at a trot, leaping over pyramids of rotting logs. As they head for the water, find Bree, doubt on her face. Exterior woods. Day. Jacob runs with Bella, maintaining a steady jog, effortlessly carrying her weight. She holds on to him, her mind heavy with concerns. Puget Sound Beach, later that day. On the misty, deserted beach, eerily, Riley rises from the water, muddy and drenched, but unfazed by the frigid water. He doesn't break stride, simply heads for the woods. One by one, the rest of the army appears behind him. They follow Riley, picking up speed, first walking, then running, an unstoppable force. At the rear is Bree. Exterior woods later that day, back on Jacob carrying Bella, climbing the mountainside, going up and up, intercutting ends as Jacob and Bella reach exterior mountains evening, aerial shot to establish you know, the scene. Jacob and Bella reached the peak where Edward waits near the tent. A Sierra Mountain Peak evening. Snow falls in earnest now. Glacial winds blow. Jacob sets Bella down. They hurry to the lee side of a peak to find a campsite erected against the sheltering face of the peak. Edward stands by the tent, pacing, waiting. He's acutely relieved to see her. He hugs her, turns to Jacob. Thank you. Jacob nods. Bella turns to Jacob as well. <laughs> You should get home before the storm hits. Saying, you'll need my connection to the pack. Keep tabs on what's going on. Edward looks down, none too happy, but knowing Jacob's right. You're not going to fight? Seth will spell me in the AM. He's not happy about missing the action, but it'll keep him out of trouble. Edward notes her disappointment, but he covers, guiding her toward the tent. Uh, <laughs> let's get you inside. Exterior tent night. Snow blows, blows sideways as the tent, wind batters the tent. A light glows from inside. Inside the tent, a lantern burns. Bella's wrapped in her down sleeping bag, fully dressed, but her teeth still rattle. It's that cold. Should have chosen a site lower down. I'm f- fine. It's, it's okay. Oh, what can I do? She can only shake her head. Edward is in hell. Interior tent. Suddenly, the front zipper opens to reveal Jacob. Can't sleep with all that teeth chattering going on. Jacob starts to climb into the tent. Edward reads his mind. Forget it. She might need her toes someday. And let's face it, I'm hotter than you. Jacob <laughs> begins to crawl to Bella's side, but Edward's hand is suddenly hard on his shoulder. Jacob's jaw clenches. Take your hand off me. Keep your hands off her. Don't fight. (laughs) Edward sees her severe discomfort. He very reluctantly pulls his hand away. Jacob looks at him in all seriousness. She gets sick? It's on you. Edward debates and makes a hard choice. He nods. Jacob climbs into the sleeping bag next to Bella. Edward sees. You'd warm up faster if you took your clothes off. Hey, survival 101. Edward glares, but quickly sees that Bella's shivering begins to lessen and the relief of warmth sweep over her. Off Edward, envious. Later that night, we're on Bella, no longer shaking. Her eyelids are losing the fight against sleep. Include Jacob spooned behind her, resting on one elbow facing Edward across the tent. Edward glares at him. Get Bella out of your little fantasies dog, or we're going to have a problem. Payback for listening to my thoughts. Trust me, I'd shut you out if I could. I really get under that ice cold skin of yours, don't I? What, you doubting her feelings for you? On Bella, her eyes flicker open slightly. The guys don't see she's awake. When Edward doesn't answer, Jacob scoffs. Mm-hmm. Nice. Picking through my brain's okay, but letting me into yours? Forget it. Look, I know she's in love with you. Good. But she's in love with me too. She just won't admit it to herself. Oh. I can't tell you if you're right. Jacob's taken aback by his honesty. Let me ask you something. If she chooses me, she won't. If she did, would you try to kill me? On Bella, she waits for the answer. Intriguing idea. But I'd never hurt her that way. No, you just turn her into a little blood-sucking demon like you. I don't want that. I never did. So stop her. I tried. From the beginning, I tried. I started with the hope that uh, that she'd outgrow me, lose interest. That didn't happen. You gave up too quickly. Then my aim was to stay with her throughout her natural life, but my world is too dangerous for her as a human. So I took myself out of her world. That I remember. 
I was trying to, I was trying to force her to let go of me, but it nearly killed us both, which leaves only one choice to do what she wants. Or thinks she wants. I'm Bella taking this in, but her eyelids grow heavier. Go back to option three. If you'd stayed away another six months, she'd have been fine. Give me more time. You have to consider the idea that I might be better for her than you are. I have considered that. I know you can protect her, but also you could give her a life, a human life. I want that for her, but I won't force her into anything again. Jacob nods. Thanks for letting me into your head. I suppose I'm feeling grateful tonight for your presence in her life. Actually, if it weren't for the fact that we're natural enemies and if you weren't trying to steal away my reason for existing, I might like you. Well, uh, if you weren't planning to suck the life out of the girl I love, I might. <laughs> no, <laughs> not even that. <laughs> yeah. Edward has to laugh. As we push on Bella's face, sleep taking over. There's still a chance, you know, that she'll change her mind. And I'd let her go. Close on Bella's face, suddenly in bright light, her eyes open, morning light blinding her. Inside the tent, morning, the sun outside illuminates the tent. Bella is alone. Exterior tent, the wind has died. The ground is white with snow, the campsite eerily quiet. The tent unzips and Bella climbs out to find a young wolf staring at her, sitting on his haunches. Uh, hi, Seth, hi. Seth will pants a little. It passes for a hello. Where's Jacob? Did he already? Not yet. She turns as Edward rounds the peak, joins her. Uh, he's making sure the woods are clear before he goes. He wraps his arms around her. Seth Wolf jogs off. Sorry about last night. Couldn't have been easy on you. It definitely won't make my list of top 10 favorite evenings. You have a list? All 10 were spent with you. Number one was when you'd said you'd marry me. Mrs. Cullen. This is the 21st century. I'm at least hyphenating me. You're marrying him? She spins to find Jacob has reappeared. His face is devastated, fighting tears of rage, betrayal. Oh, no, Jake. You. You knew he was listening. Deserves to know. Which confirms for Jacob that it's true. He turns, strides toward the woods. Bella starts to run after him. Stop, Jake! Bella, let him. Don't. Just let me talk to him. Alone. Edward sees her desperation. He sinks resignedly and heads into the woods disappearing. Bella races to Jacob. Jake, please. I'm done. I'm so done. How can I fix this? You can't. I can, by going down there and killing something. No, not like this. You're not thinking clearly. Maybe I'll get killed and make things simple for you. What? No, Jake, just stay here. Why, Bella? Give me one damn reason. I don't want to lose you. Not good enough. Because you're my best friend. Still not good enough. You're too important, please. He keeps moving. She searches for something to convince him. Kiss me. He stops, looks back at her. I'm asking you. He doesn't need to be asked twice. He grabs and kisses her. His anger melts into passion. As the kiss continues, Bella, to her surprise, finds herself surrendering to it, pushing close on her face as a wave of repressed feelings rises up, flooding her mind. Exterior Bella's house in Bella's fantasy. 
Years pass as Bella and Jacob, arm in arm, start sitting on the stoop in the bright sunlight. Now they're in their late 20s. They rock an infant. Renee appears, takes the child, joyously tosses her grandchild in the air. Early 30s. There are two kids now. Jacob roughhouses with the oldest boy as Bella and a happy aging Charlie help the toddler girl to walk. 40s. Their two grown kids pile out of Jacob's car, home for a holiday. Gray-haired Charlie and Billy are there with Bella to welcome them. Finally, in their 60s, it's Bella and Jacob who are graying now, playing with their grandchildren, contented, a family. Exterior campsite, extreme close-up on Bella morning, as she abruptly snaps out of it, pulls away, reeling. Jacob whispers in her ear, that should have been our first kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob is torn, doesn't want to leave. I have to go. I won't be long. Jacob heads out to the fight. Bella's eyes water with guilt, confusion, emotion. She hurries back to the tent. He appears from around the rock, comes toward her. She sees his face, stops, knows. You saw. No, but Jacob's thoughts are very loud. I don't know what happened. You love him. I love you more. I shouldn't have forced you to choose between us. Please, don't be understanding. I don't deserve it. I, I... It's my fault. When I went away, I left you bleeding and he stitched you up. I, I can't blame you for something I made necessary. Don't you dare blame yourself. I just want you to be happy, no matter. But he stops abruptly, turns to see Seth Wolf loping out of the woods, growling. Edward reads his thoughts. Flash pop to exterior, clearing the woods, mourning. Inside of Seth slash Edward's vision, a pair of male bare feet step onto the wet grass. We pan up to find a newborn, hungry, ready for a fight. Back on Edward, his expression grave. He turns to Bella. It's starting. Back in the clearing of the woods, back on that male newborn. A beat, then suddenly from behind him, the entire newborn army blitzes mm. out of the woods and into the field. We see the frenzy in their eyes, their rabid thirst as they follow the scent of Bella's blood. But the scent trail ends here. They're confused. Suddenly something bolts from the trees with lightning speed and tackles a newborn. The other newborn spin to find a lethal looking Jasper and a crouch beside his victim's body, holding its disembodied head. They rush Jasper, but bam, 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 three of them go down, tackled by Esme, Rosalie, Carlisle, Emmett and Alice. Out of nowhere, lunges Samuel, flanked by two wolves. They tear a newborn to pieces. Four other wolves dive into the fray. We smash from one savage conflict to another. Raw, brutal. Emmett sprints full born to the fight, rel relishing the battle. The wolves work as a pack, coordinated, deadly. Jasper controls the field's strategy and speed versus strength. Rosalie fights with icy calm. Alice with precognition. Esme and Carl. Carlisle fights side by side, but the newborns are brutal and strong as hell. Our vampires slash wolves are taking some vicious hits. Then, in slow motion, Jacob Wolf charges into the clearing, tackling a newborn, going for its neck. And we're back at the campsite on Edward reading Seth Wolf's mind, translating for Bella. Jacob just got there. He's good. Stay on Edward's face as he sees the action through Seth Wolf's mind. The camera circles Edward as Bella and his surroundings disappear, dissolving back inside Edward's mind. Edward stands amidst the fight, the action all around him. Sam Wolf and Jacob Wolf charge a newborn. Each wolf grab an arm in their mouths and rip. Paul Wolf is surrounded by three newborns. Emmett comes to his aid. They share a look at battlefield rapprochement. Carlisle and Esme move in on Bree, but she backs up frightened. Esme and Carl share a look. They relax their attack stance, try to calm her, talk to her. Alice starts from newborn to newborn, not even looking at them, knowing their next move. She sweeps their feet, keeping them off balance, confusing them. It's a dance. Jasper is to step behind her, trying to give her cover. Edward sees a newborn take note of Jasper's protective actions. Edward yells at Jasper, though he can't hear. Jasper, back off. You can't be everywhere. Watch out! As a newborn appears behind Jasper and bites his shoulder, Alice spins, flings the newborn to Rosalie, Emmett, and Carla, who kill him. Alice tends to Jasper, angry. I can handle myself. Back at the mountain campsite, back on Edward and Bella. Is Jasper all right? Edward! But he sees only Seth Wolf's thoughts, talks to himself. Don't let them protect each other. Good, go around. Suddenly Edward stops, blinks, briefly disoriented as his mind is cut off from the battlefield. He looks around, finds Seth Wolf frozen as well. They share a tense look. Someone's hurt. Seth, go. Seth Wolf bolts away from the campsite fast. 
Is it Jasper? Edward whips Bella behind him against the cliff wall and takes a defensive stance in front of her. She's close. I can hear her thoughts. She saw we weren't there, but she caught my scent. Exterior clearing tree line battlefield minutes earlier. Victoria searches the battlefield from the tree line. She abruptly turns away from the fight and starts running, following Edward's scent. She knew I'd be with you. Knew Alice would be too busy to see her decide. We're back on Bella and Edward. Victoria found us. And she's not alone. Which is when Riley steps out of the woods. Bella immediately recognizes him, is taken aback. Riley edges closer, watching Edward's every move, as they both carefully position position themselves. Riley, listen to me. Victoria's using you to distract me, but she knows I'll kill you. Riley hesitates, surprised to be addressed. Actually, she's glad she won't have to deal with you anymore. Victoria emerges from the woods, forming a triangle with Riley, Bella, and Edward at the apex. Don't listen, Riley. I told you about their mind tricks. Yes, I can read her mind. That's how I know what she thinks of you. How I know she doesn't love you. He's lying. Her sole purpose for creating you and this army was to avenge her true mate, James. That's all she cares about. Not you. Riley's beginning to hesitate. He glances at Victoria. There's only you. You know that. Riley focuses back on Edward, positioning himself to attack. Victoria's eyes burrow into Bella's with bloodlust, revenge. Think about it. You're from Forks. You know the area. That's why she picked you. She's using you like she's using the rest of them. Riley falters ever so slightly, doubt seeping into his mind, but Victoria's face is convincingly emotional. Riley, don't let him do this to us. I love you. Riley needs to believe her. His resolve returns. Is that me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Page 100. 99. 99. Sorry. Or I guess 100 in the PDF. But 99 is <laughs> the script. Oh, okay, really let me do this. Let me do this. Let me do this. Okay, uh, I'll give you. I'll give you the lead yeah, up. Give, I'll give, give you the lead up. Before. I'll give you the lead up. Give me a moment before. <clears throat> <clears throat> Riley needs to believe her. His resolve returns. You're dead. <laughs> Charlie, Char- Charlie charges toward Otter who doesn't move because he knows Seth Wolf is leaping from the cliff above to land on Riley, taking a chunk out of Riley's hand. Riley roars with fury and pain as Seth Wolf circles back for another attack. While Seth Wolf keeps Riley on the defense, Edward starts toward Victoria. She backs toward the trees. Edward sees she's about to escape, darts into her path. You can escape. You always do, but you'll never get another chance like this. Victoria hisses at him, backs further away. Don't you want her? Don't you want me to feel the pain you felt when I killed James? When I tore him to pieces and turned him into ashes? Into nothing? Victoria finally erupts and charges Bella, but Edward never lets her get close. He intercepts her and they roll down the hill in a death grip. On Bella watching this battle, desperate to help. Meanwhile, Riley kicks Seth Wolf hard against the cliff. Sharp shards of rock fall around Bella. Seth Wolf battered goes down. Riley spins towards Bella. Edward now has to protect Bella from both vampires. And he does with impressive skill. With lightning fast speed, he bolts to Riley, kicking him back. He drops to Victoria, smashing into her. As Seth Wolf struggles to rise, Riley joins Victoria's battle, providing her with the tiny advantage she needs. Bella's POV on Edward. Riley tackles him to his knees. Victoria grabs Edward from behind. Time freezes. And in slow motion, as Bella's eyes meet Edward's, we close on Bella's face. We see her clarity. She's never in her life even been more sure of what she wants than in this moment. With purpose, she grabs a sharp piece of slate and flash pop to the third wife. Raising her dagger, she plunges the sharp downward, stabbing her arm. Blood immediately flows, dripping bright red onto the white snow, and we smash back to real time on Riley, spinning toward Bella, the scent making him wild. On Victoria, catching the smell, her head whips around toward Bella. Edward seizes the moment, dead drops to the ground while flipping Victoria over his head, across the clearing, and into a tree, breaking it in two. Edward spins on Riley, who's still bedazzled by the blood. Hear a screeching sound like metal tearing as suddenly Riley's screaming. His arm is gone. Edward tosses the arm aside and bolts back to Victoria. Seth Wolf recovered, leaps up, tackles Riley, and drags him screaming into the woods.
Victoria! Victoria doesn't even glance at him, revealing to Riley the painful truth. The last thing we see of Riley is his tragically betrayed face. Then we hear the sounds of Seth tearing him apart, the metallic screeching. As Bella tears her shirt to create a makeshift bandage, Edward charges towards Victoria. The two clash and begin a blurred battle until he pummels her down and finally maneuvers himself behind her, getting her in a death grip. Victoria struggles. Bella is directly in her eye line. She glares at Bella, who glares back every bit as fiercely. Edward's lips are at Victoria's neck. It looks as if he kisses her. He bites a huge chunk from her neck, ripping her head off. As Bella watches Victoria's body, body crumple to the ground, all sound disappears. The air goes still. The atmosphere changes. This nemesis, this relentless demon, is finally dead, or almost. Eerily, it still moves slightly, a long beat. Then Edward looks up at Bella. Their eyes meet, but shame, fear, cloud his face. She moves toward him, slowly, purposefully. As she reaches him, he turns away. Oh, I didn't want you to see me like that. She stops him. Touches his face tenderly, her eyes telling him it's okay. I'll get some bandages for that arm. He starts for the temp, but Seth Wolf, self, Seth Wolf abruptly lets out a sharp bark. Edward turns, his expression fills with concern. Something's wrong. Alice wants us to come, now. Why, what's happening? Exterior Woods Day, slow motion, the Volturi, Jane, Alec, Dimitri, Felix glide past the trees with effortless grace and speed. Exterior clearing in the woods day, a massive fire burns as the Cullens and the wolves hurriedly drag what's left of the newborns to it for incineration. A purple black smoke rises. Edward and Bella race out of the trees, beelining for Alice and the rest of the Cullens gathered near the fire. How long? A few minutes, maybe 10. Bella scans the field for Jacob as Rosalie? Oh, she, uh, I think, I think she left. No, she's right there. No, Sarah's right there. Right. Oh. oh. Her mic's All right. Up. Is your mic muted? I, she is unmuted. Okay. Uh, Pete. <laughs> Go right. for it. You're Rosalie now. <laughs> They timed her arrival well. <laughs> Probably hoping the newborns took a few of us out. Edward stops as he sees someone by the fire. What's she doing here? Bella looks to the fire by which cover powers the newborn Bree. We offered her safe haven if she stopped fighting. She took it. The pack needs to leave. The Volturi won't honor a truce with werewolves. Where's Jacob? There. Bella's POV on the tree line clear across the field. As Jacob Wolf emerges, Bella sighs with enormous relief. He sees her as well, starts toward her. But suddenly, on Jacob Wolf, he hears a vicious snarl coming from behind him in the woods. And we spin to see, in the woods, a light gray wolf, Leia Wolf, cornering one last male newborn who is hiding. Leia Wolf charges on Edward with the Cullens. He can't see the conflict, but he can hear it in his mind. Leia, don't! Back on Leia Wolf and the male newborn in the woods, the male newborn maneuvers out of her way, spins and grabs her ruff, fiercely yanking her off her paws, but Jacob Wolf leaps on the male newborn, tackling him. They roll into the clearing, where Jacob bites a piece of his face off. But the male newborn gets his arms around Jacob Wolf and crushes him. Jacob Wolf howls in agony. Bella sees this from afar. Jacob! The other wolves are <laughs> instantly there and pounce on the male newborn, their teeth forcing him to release Jacob Wolf, who crumples to the ground. As they pull him apart, Edward and Carlisle appear at Jacob's side. On Bella, racing across the field to reach Jacob Wolf. On Jacob Wolf, as he transforms into a human, naked, grotesquely twisted and broken, barely able to breathe. Carlisle quickly examines him as he writhes in pain. Edward steadies him, gripping his hand. Jacob, hold on. Carlisle will take care of you. The bones on the right half of his body are shattered. Jacob, in excruciating pain, squeezes Edward's hand. Bella reaches them, dropping to her knees beside Edward. I mean, Jacob. She strokes his face, trying to comfort him. You're Jake. I'm right here. Sam, Paul, Embry, Jer Jared, Quill, and Leia, now in human form, clothed, race up. Jacob, you idiot. I had it. Yeah. 
I need to set the bones before his accelerated healing kicks in. It's already starting. We have to get him out of here before the Vulturi arrive. We won't win a fight with them. Go. I'll be there as soon as I can. We'll bring him to Billy's. Come on, Jake. Jacob cries out in pain as the pack lift him. Bella oh. agonizes as she watches them disappear into the woods. She and Edward exchange a look of shared concern. Then... And here... The Cullens gather in the center of the field, converging around Bella. She sees nothing through the oily smoke from the fire. A beat. Then we hear a flat female voice. It appears you've done our work for us. (laughs) From out of the mist and the smoke (laughs) emerge the Volturi, Jane, and behind her, Felix, Dimitri, and Alec. Jane assesses the scene, taking in Bella as well. Impressive. I've never seen a coven escape an assault of this magnitude. We were lucky. I doubt that. I doubt that. Darren? It appears we missed an entertaining (laughs) fight, sister. (laughs) It's not often we're rendered unnecessary. Only you'd arrived a half hour earlier. You could have fulfilled your purpose here. Pity. Jane then sees the newborn, Bree. Crouching by the fire. You missed one. Oh, Oh, uh, we offered her asylum in exchange for her surrender. That wasn't yours to offer. As Jane moves to Brie, Esme shoots Carlisle a concerned look. Carlisle steadily shakes his head. Don't. Why did you come? Before Brie can answer, Jane focuses her power, sending an invisible searing current through Brie's body. Brie screams in pain. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) Uh, flinches as may quickly steps up they came to destroy us to kill bella jane ignores as may continues her torture enjoying it who created you don't have to do that she'll tell you anything you want to know oh i know carlisle puts a hand on as shoulder brie screaming briefly stops jane waits for an answer i don't know riley wouldn't tell us he said our thoughts weren't safe. Jane zaps her again. Esme ah! to say something, but... Ah! Her name was Victoria. Perhaps you knew her? Bree's pain abruptly ceases. Jane faces Edward with an innocent smile that's somehow unnerving. The th- other three Volturi are suddenly positioned behind Jane. We didn't even see them move. Bella plants herself firmly at Edward's side. She can't protect him, but she can die trying. The air is tense. This could turn bad. Fast. Carlisle intercedes with great and purposeful calm. Edward. If the Volturi had knowledge of Victoria, they would have stopped her. Isn't that right, Jane? Jane just looks at Carlisle, a long beat. Felix. Felix moves to Brie. Esme can't hold back. She didn't know what she was doing. The Volturi don't give second chances. Keep that in mind. Chaos, the Chaos, Chaos will be interested to hear she's still human. Bella faces her strong, unflinching. Take a set. Jane is ever so slightly taken aback by Bella's confidence. Her look lingers on Bella. This human. Edward stands ready to to defend her, but Jane turns back to Felix. I wonder if you'll still be immune to my powers after you've changed, Bella. Meanwhile, Felix, with his enormous strength, easily tears Brie limb from limb. Her screams quickly cease, though the metallic screeching sound continues. Thank you, Felix. Until next time. The Cullens can do nothing but stand by, grim-faced. Esme tries not to watch. Off Bella, fighting revulsion, but standing strong with the rest of the Cullens as the thick plume of smoke rises. We're exterior Jacob's house nighttime. Billy sits in his wheelchair on the porch, surrounded by the pack, including Emily, but without Sam. They wait anxiously. Bella's truck pulls up. She hurriedly climbs out. As she reaches the porch, a loud yell of excruciating pain emanates from inside the house. <laughs> Bella flinches, feeling the pain herself. They all do. It's all Billy can do to keep it together. Emily next to him puts an arm around his shoulder. Been going on for a while. Doc's re-breaking his bones. Bella reacts to the horror of that. Leia paces. Why do you have to butt in? I could have taken that. (laughs) You could have lost Leia. 
Then they all spin toward the front door as it opens. Carlisle exits with Sam. The worst is over. Uh, he'll be all right. Billy exhales heavily, tears threatening. Sam puts a hand on Billy's shoulder. Emily wraps an arm around Sam's waist. I gave him some morphine, but his body temperature will burn it off soon. I'll come back to set up a trip. Thank you. And make sure he doesn't phase until I clear him. The bones really need to set. We'll keep him in line. Yeah, good luck with that. He's asking for you. <laughs> they all look at her. A combination of pleading, don't hurt him, and threatening, if you hurt him. Off Bella as she heads inside with trepidation. We're inside Jacob's bedroom. Bella quietly enters to find Jacob lying in bed. The entire right side of his body is in a series of braces. Bella can't bear to see him this way, but she forces a smile. Jake. He looks up with some effort, breath short, but he smiles. Hey, I've been worried about you. You were worried about me? Yes, Edward would read my mind, or Seth's. Was he hard on you? I wish. He wasn't even mad at me. Or you. He didn't yell? No ultimatum? It would have been easier if he had. Well, damn. Just, damn. He's better than I thought. He wasn't playing a game. Right. Belly, he's not as perfect as you think. I know exactly who he is. Can we not talk about this? I'd rather get all the rebreaking done at once. She carefully sits next to him on the bed. I'm sorry, Jake, but it's like Sam imprinting on Emily. I never had a choice with Edward. That's crap. You're not a wolf, remember? Still, it is what it is. And beat as it sinks in, he struggles to tamp down emotion. At least I know I did everything I could. It wasn't even easy getting you to admit your feelings for me. I think I fought them because part of me knew they wouldn't change anything. I'm exactly right for you, you know? It would have been as easy as breathing with me. You know I love you. You know how much I wish it was enough. A long beat. Finally, she rises. Should I come back? I need some time, but I'll always be waiting. Till my heart stops beating. Maybe even then. She returns the smile. There's a sadness between them, but also a resignation. Off Bella, grateful for this tiny opening he's left her. Exterior meadow magic hour. The grass is a welcoming, rich green. The wildflowers are in bloom. The light is low, luminescent. Edward and Bella lie in the grass, her head on his chest. It's 13th. It's a month before my birthday. I don't need to be another year older than you. And Alice thinks she can put together a wedding by then. I'm sure she can, but there's no rush. I've chosen my life. I want to start living it. Concern and suspicion fill him. And you're letting Alice plan the whole thing? Dress, reception, guest list. Who knows who she'll invite? Does it matter? Edward sits up, looks her in the eyes. Tell me why you're doing this. What, the wedding? You're trying to make everyone else happy, but you're already giving up too much. You're wrong. She rises as well. Going to him, clarity washing over her. This wasn't just a choice between you and Jacob. It's between who I should be and who I actually am. She circles him, insight energizing her as she speaks. I've always felt out of step, literally stumbling through life. I've never felt normal, but now I know. I'm not normal and I don't want to be. I face death and loss and pain in your world, but I've also never felt stronger, more real, more myself, because it's my world too, Edward. It's where I belong. He takes this in, sees her strength, has to smile. You're saying it's not all about me? Sorry. She wraps her arms around him, looks up at him. 
I've made a mess figuring all this out. Now I want to do it right, responsibly, and I will tie you to me in every way humanly possible. Starting with a wedding. Actually, something more difficult first, probably even dangerous. <laughs> it's time to tell Charlie. Highly dangerous. The thing you're bulletproof. <laughs> I'll need that ring. Edward smiles, pulls the black box from his pocket. He removes the ring, takes her left hand in his, and we slowly begin to pull up and back on the two of them, silhouetted by the light which reflects off the flowers, giving the blossoms a warm, magical glow. It is against this beautiful, romantic backdrop that Edward slips the ring into Bella's finger, where it will stay for eternity. Fade to black. Oh, wow! God damn. Yay, everybody. Yay, good Thank job, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man. Sam, you can end the stream whenever you like now. Thanks for joining us. Good job, everybody. I, I, I want to read these comments. Like, I, I haven't read any of them. <laughs> the comments are pretty good. I don't yeah. understand these Italians. <laughs> um, yes, oh, let's, like, freaking the valedictorian speech. Let's all get that tattooed onto us. <laughs> That's great. It's great. It's so relatable. It's so relatable. <laughs> Oh, like she was Aww. born to lead, honestly. <laughs> honestly, yeah. My God. Amazing. Who the heck knows? Um, Sarah, are you okay? No. No. No, we can't hear you. Is no. there like a mute button on the actual mic that, that yeah. is mm. pressed? Hmm. There is. I know the mic. Press that. Press that <laughs> red button. <laughs> if it is it blinking at you, Sarah? No. Mm. Just can, plug you un- me in again. can you unplug your mic and and uh <laughs> the mic back in? No, from the computer, I, from your laptop. Yes, this movie is the clearest example of why I've never been Team Jacob. Oh, yeah. I oh, there we go. Cameras. Nice. We can hear you now. <laughs> there, there was a moment where oh, I was. Now like, we can. No, we can. Thank God we can't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can you? In your pre- <laughs> preferences, you might be able to select the mic. That might be the issue. Mm. Yeah. You go to like audio. Uh, yeah, audio, audio preferences. preferences. I really appreciate this double angle on watching Nikki and Pete snuggle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, damn. You. How was your flight? Awesome. It was fine. It was really pretty, but it was so early. Super early. Yeah. How long was it? Um, only like an uh-huh. hour and 15 minutes, something like yeah. that. We got two angles of uh, Nikki and Pete. <laughs> um, Aaron, do you have to get going? I thought I did, but it ended up being a little bit later. So, okay. Okay. Gucci. Yeah. I will have to go soon, though. <laughs> I put the hot potato link for anyone who does not know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What is it? Oh, my gosh. So good. Hot Wait, potato. Karen, do you want to, like, screen share it? Oh, I can try. Yeah, what is this? Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Yeah, please. Is, there, is anyone not familiar? <laughs> Wait, I host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I will screen share it. <laughs> um, it's a bad lip reading. I like it. Has yeah. anyone oh, seen this? Or? Yes. Yeah, it's great. It's so freaking. Are you sharing good. your screen? Because I don't see anything. Yeah, hold on. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, sorry, my computer is hella slow. You can, if you want to make me, <laughs> if you want to make me able to screen share, I can do it. I also don't know how. Oh, there we are. It's in oh your... my god! Oh Jesus! Oh. Oh. It stopped. Damn it! And then click share sound, optimize for video feed. Okay, here we go, people. people this, I hope change. this works. Can everyone see? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Yeah. I promised I wouldn't do this, and who cares? I need to 
see my alphabet and I can never trust skeletons. Hmm, don't you wanna set me down? I just want my lily pad. <laughs> hot potato. Yeah, one time I bit a geese. My left shoe leaked sock grease. Mm, that's gross. Ate a big leech. Ooh, how'd you keep it down? Hot potato. The tin man <laughs> sat in the soup. Of course he did. I promised I wouldn't do this, and who cares? <laughs> Got it? Oh! I need to say my alphabet, and oh. <laughs> I can never trust skeletons. <laughs> I think we're Don't still streaming, according to Sam. Oh, so? Oh, Hot potato. Hot potato. The tin man <laughs> sat in the soup. Of course he did. I promised I wouldn't I do this. I don't know why you do that. Is it good? It's looping. It's like looping, no, yeah. That's the video. No, but it just keeps looping? I know. I think so, yeah. It's a moment. The actual one. I couldn't see a different one. in it in 30 seconds. <laughs> the bad lip reading Twilight one? Oh, the Twilight, oh, Twilight 3. The bad lip reading. Twilight 3. Nice. Twilight Tres. Hey, what's going on? Should I pause stream? <laughs> <laughs> Never pause. Sorry, I thought I said. I thought I was like. Oh. <laughs> Thank I you. I hope somebody was still watching.